Planning Commission meeting for October 17, 2017. For those that have not had the pleasure of attending our meetings before, just a couple of housekeeping things so you know how things go. First of all, please silence your cell phones if you might. That makes uh, for a less distracting meeting. Second of all, after we're done calling the roll and approving the minutes from the last meeting, we go over items one at a time. The way it works is city staff presents on an item. Then initially, after they present, it's open just to the, the commission for technical questions. Once we're done with our technical questions, we open it up to the public for commentary and question. If you have something to say, we strongly encourage you to do so. Please step up to the microphone and the podium over there and state your name and address so we have it for the minutes and so our television viewers can know who is speaking. And also, uh, we have a very long agenda today, folks, so if we keep our nose to the grindstone and focus, we should get out of here by the stroke of midnight. <laughs> the second thing is, uh, our, our mayor has requested humbly that we, because he has to leave early, that we, after item one, that we insert five and six before we go to two, and unless someone has a problem with that, we'll just do that. All right, with that, let's call the roll. David Borsak. Present. Ed Bowen. Jeffrey Jones. Here. Bartek. Here. John Hens. Here. Steve Cummings. Here. Kathleen Kopp. Here. John Kiefer. Robert Viter. Here. Michael Ford. All right, moving on to approval of the minutes from the October 3rd meeting. Do we have any corrections or deletions or additions to those? Move to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. No. Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, nobody's opposed. Motion clearly passes. Let us move on to item number one, residential design standards variance request for the expansion of one window at 35 Castle Court. Thank you. You're welcome. So, yes, as mentioned, this is a request for a design standards variance for the expansion of a single window at a resi residential property. Um, it's on the east side elevation of this home. Um, the subject site here that is outlined is zoned SR5 residential, single family residential, and then all the immediate uses around it are single family residential, SR5 zoning. And the um, ordinance sections that we referenced for this were um, section 3241B1. And this regulation is twofold. The first part of it is existing window openings on the front facade, including gables, or on the first 20 feet of the side facade, extending from the front facade plane, shall be maintained and not be closed or filled totally or partially. The second part of that regulation is if standard size replacement windows cannot fit into an existing window opening, a 10% variation in the height to width proportion for replacement windows is permitted. Um, so as mentioned before, single family, um, they want to expand the window on the east elevation. Let's see if there's here. So you can see that elevation there. There's an existing window that's yeah. probably five yeah. square feet in area, and they want to expand it to approximately 35 square feet, so it would be about seven times the size in area. And the idea is that they want to use that room as a sitting area to take advantage of the views of Lake Winnebago. Staff evaluated this and looked at the um, request and found that the impact would not be detrimental to the surrounding properties. Um, it would not be contrary to the public interest because the increase of window area will not adversely affect the structure's architectural design, the neighborhood character, or the curb appearance of the block. So staff recommends approval of this variance request to permit the increase in area of the side window there. This is one of those uh, situations where the, the ordinance itself, when we wrote the ordinance, we never really thought about making windows larger. I mean, our concern has always been smaller, creating blank facades. Uh, so we're, we, we don't run into these situations that often. That's why you're here for a variance. Uh, we might look at doing a code change because what's being proposed from an architecture, from a design standpoint, staff doesn't really have an issue with, um, with, 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 with these types of things. Okay, technical questions from the commission. Seeing none, anyone here from the public to speak to this item today? Going once, twice. Okay, back to the commission. Motion to approve. Second. Any questions on the motion? Seeing none, let's call a roll. Holmes? Aye. Hintz? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Rob? Aye. Weigert? Aye. Ford? Aye. 
Borsak? Aye. Bowen? Aye. Boytek? Aye. Motion carried, 9-0. All right, as planned, we're moving on to item number five and then six before we get to two. So item number five is comprehensive land use plan map amendment for nine properties located from 1610 Oshkosh Avenue to 1746 Oshkosh Avenue. Give me just a second to get to where we're going. No problem. Just have a chance to get our stuff in order as well. All right. Okay, so before us we have a comprehensive <coughs> land amendment from 1610 to 1746 Oshkosh Avenue. The initial request came in for seven um, privately held lots. Um, they would be kind of <clears throat> starting here, going to this lot. Upon review, the staff is recommending we include the last two lots in the area. We'll kind of get into um, the reasonings for that as we go forward. But in total, we are looking at nine uh, lots that are presently called out for <laughs> residential within both the 10 and 20 year land use plans. Um, there are several vacant properties within it, and the rest um, are either single-family owner-occupied or single-family rental properties, um, but they are all single-family in nature that are occupied with structures at today's date. Uh, to the west, we have a commercial uh, property. To the south, we have some commercial property as well as some residential area. And then to the north, we have um, Lakeshore Municipal Golf Course. To the east, Mary Jewel Park, just to kind of orient ourselves to the area we're looking at today. So the applicant is proposing to change um, the seven lots from residential to commercial, and then with the addition of the two uh, eastern and the lots, the city is proposing to include those as well. Um, Oshkosh Avenue has approximately uh, 15,400 vehicles per day. That's the last traffic count data we have um, from the state, which was 2013. It is also a designated <coughs> truck route within the city. So we have a highly traveled commercial kind of corridor roadway here that has a small residential section kind of separated off to the north. So as the city was looking at this, it would be our um, opinion that with that kind of island of residential to the north, the way the commercial corridor has slowly been expanding from the west, that this is a redevelopment opportunity for some commercial property within the city. And so you can see we have you know, three, this arrow's a little old, there are actually three of those that are vacant today. The rest are single family structures. They're kind of in the northeast corner of UDC Mary Jo Park. So we do have a proposed concept plan of what the developer was is considering on the seven lots that, that they would like to have changed to a commercial land use designation. Um, it shows um, some retail slash restaurant facilities, um, a hotel, and a possibly a gas station. All of those would be things that if we would switch this to a commercial land use designation upon rezoning could be considered for this area. The reason that we're considering adding the two additional lots is it would create a very small island of just two residentially zoned parcels. Ultimately, if this de development of this nature would go forward at some point in time, I'm not saying immediately, but it would make sense that those last two lots would go for commercial development as well. It would not affect the current property owner's ability to use the property. Their zoning would stay residential. It would just create an opportunity that in down the line, they did want to sell their properties for commercial development the comprehensive land use designation would be in place for future development, but it would have no effect on their current properties today. So with that, the staff is recommending approval of the <coughs> comprehensive plan land use change, both, both these seven parcels the petitioner has presented, as well as the two the city is recommending including, that kind of just squares off that area instead of leaving a little island sliver of residential. All right, technical questions, we'll start with David and then go to Michael. Um, I appreciate uh, this proposed uh, development, but I'm wondering if uh, our vision is a little small on this, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure what the vehicle is, but I would suggest instead of piecemealing this that we look at uh, having some kind of a development gateway area overlay, however would be, would be the most efficient and effective to stretch from uh, I-41 to the uh, to the bridge to the fox river and incorporate uh one, certainly one if not both sides of of uh of oshkosh avenue uh, and so that we could uh, 
control the, the, the development and, and have uh, design standards that would be appropriate uh, for this gateway route to the community. And that would definitely be stuff to address during the next item. This is strictly looking at the comprehensive plan and whether commercial is a suitable use for that area. And the petitioner did file this. We do have to react to the request as well. Uh, but then would, would the, would we, uh, that you couldn't increase the vision of this? And say that no, we, we, we would make, if you will. Uh, well, I think David, you're, you're, what you're talking about is we'd have to do additional land use analysis along the corridor because some of the areas that are residential might be appropriate for residential in the area, some might, might be neighborhood mixed use. So I think what you're talking about is something that we can do from a land use perspective, but we, we'd have to do further analysis of, of that particular corridor to see what is the appropriate land use in those areas. You would then follow back with what Mark is, Mark is talking about with the next item, which would be that zone change. Zone change could then get into the some zone of those design what, standards. The, the zone change is really what's going to implement your is going to implement your land use plan. Mike, yeah, for the two existing structures or the two uh, occupied, yes. would this change um, impact their ability to sell it for residential use? It would not the because the, the underlying zoning would not change. Not they change. would still be okay. single family residential properties with single family residential zoning. Okay, thank you. Other technical questions, Ed? I'm just looking at. It. I mean this. David, to your point, this would essentially continue the line of 10 and 20 year commercial just extended essentially from the highway to Mary Jewel, right? Yes. That, which, I mean, to some degree, David, I think that maybe ties it together the way that we're talking no. about. So you do have that ability. It would seem to me like maybe we do have that. David, you want to go down to the river. I think David really you, wants I mean, to go you down want to, you want to go east, across the here as part of that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Back to David. If, if I no, if I envision it, Ed, uh, is that maybe this is the opportunity to have some kind of a holistic vision from 41 to the bridge. We know that which is needed. Yeah, I think. and I think corridor that the, plan is needed for Oshkosh. I don't mind mm -hmm. that. Yeah, <laughs> and this is a corridor, and uh, I understand that we may. I, I believe I understood you that there may be a section. That will always be appropriate residential, but what I sus but if we look from the river going to 41, there certainly are properties there uh, that, that are ripe for redevelopment, and certainly I would be uh, as those are redeveloped would have similar type design standards or conditions, and so the question is how do we do that so that uh, we're consistent uh, all the way along Oshkosh Avenue. Well, I think there, there's two ways, and I'll, let me answer David's question, there's two ways of doing it. We could just simply uh, not move forward and, and not move forward with this request and say we want to, we want to develop a plan for this area or um, we're responding to a, to a development request. Um, I, mean, I mean, what am I missing? We either do a plan for the area or we start implementing in chunks. We move forward, we move forward with this section with the knowledge saying, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna move forward with the plan after this. And I think the stuff you're you're getting at is something that we could address in a corridor plan that is goes well above and beyond just the land use designation when we talk about that entire corridor all the way from the river out to the highway. Especially if you wanna start talking about things like design standards and quality design. Those aren't things that we do within the comprehensive land use map. Those are things that we would do through overlay districts or plan developments, you know, getting those standards in place. Those are a little separate from the actual land use map. Now, those could help us identify changes we need to make in our land use map, but would not necessarily be part of a land use map change, so if that makes sense. Yeah, the, 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 the comprehensive plan is not really a regulating plan. It's, it'd be, it, the, the comp when, we, it, when we put the zoning on it, that becomes a, the regulating plan for the area. Okay. To your point, then, it would be the second issue uh, where, where the direction would be correct. Yeah, we're, okay. right now we're just trying to get, I think right now we're just trying to get the land use designations in the, in the appropriate okay. place for future development in that area. Okay, Mr. Mayor and then Jeff. Uh, as you go east on Oshkosh Avenue, the closer you get to the river, that becomes commercial again, even though RDA has bought a lot of the buildings, we're taking them down. On the south side of Oshkosh Avenue, yeah. there's another small park. I think is uh, is on Sawyer Creek. So there. it's 
Yes, there's a park there. I can't remember there's the name of it. There's a park, so it's yeah. rapidly, it's not as residential as it was when you were young. Nothing is. <laughs> Jeff. We don't know when that was, actually. Jeff and Ankat. Well, since this is technical, no, Tom, I'll, I'll wait till okay. after the public comment to comment on, on some All things right. that Dave and Darren were talking about. Kathy? This is technical, but uh, it upsets me. All right. <laughs> um, That's why we're here. Reading the letter of... Um, request dated August 2nd this in this one and in the next one it states that the existing land use to the north of the properties is the city owned golf course that is for sale I object to the fact that that's in there and I'm not unhappy if the petitioner knows that all right any other technical questions okay seeing not anyone here anyone here from the audience to speak of this item today Now's your chance. Um, hi, Steve Hoopman, 5105 Iameda Road, Oshkosh. Um, I'm the developer on the project sure. and just here to answer any questions anybody might have. And for the record, I did not write that letter. It came from Cedar Corporation, <laughs> the engineering firm. So, okay. I had to say. Any questions for the petitioner, as long as he is available? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Is there any Define plan projects for this area right now. Is there any? Yeah, I mean the the the, the timing of changing the, the land use map. Yes, we Easy. are we are under contract to uh, to start development uh, after the, the council meeting in January. Um, part of the properties have already been resold to uh, users, and so that's why we're moving forward with the plan okay. at this point. Thank you. Yes. I mean that's the that's the plan that they're proposing at this point. Okay. Conceptual <clears throat> right now. Any other questions for a petitioner? Thank you, sir. Okay. Anyone else here to speak to the sign today? Come on up, sir. My name is Timothy Smith. I live at seventeen zero five Oshkosh Avenue, which is at the corner of Oshkosh and Westfield. It's that large Victorian that was vacant for many many years. First, of all, I'll say, I. I am for redevelopment of commercial use and, and things that will benefit the city. However, I did move to a residential area. I know it's a combined residential and commercial area, but I did move to a residential area for that purpose, to reside, not to have businesses directly across my street. I have enough issues right now picking up trash that comes off Oshkosh Avenue and off Westfield. Uh, dealing with cars that drive entirely too fast. You have 15,000 cars as of, what, five years ago, 2013? There's more than that now. That's not patrolled. That's not taken care of. Um, beyond my children that live in my house uh, and those at the daycare center, I think that it's just going to get worse when you put a commercial structure directly across the street. I'm a 27-year public safety professional. For 27 years, I was involved in law enforcement, firefighting, 911 dispatching. Long-term uses of hotels that are extended stays start beautiful. Construction is done well. Everything works out really, really well. They tend to go downhill. Not in every neighborhood, but in my experience, a lot. What I'm concerned with there is what is going to be done to prevent sex offenders, primarily is my main concern, from using that extended stay in such a close proximity to my house and to special needs kids and that daycare center. I'm also concerned about the proposed expansion. That roadway is going to gain more traffic. It's gonna break down faster. I'm concerned, number one, who is going to pay for the expansion of that road if any turn lanes or anything to that is needed? Who's going to pay for that upkeep? I've been dealing with construction for two years since I've moved here. Westfield Avenue, I just got my $19,000 bill for that. I'm not looking for another bill on Oshkosh Avenue due to the development or that being broken down any further faster once this place goes in it was said here that that it doesn't affect the use of properties which is true as far as their zoning I understand that 
but what it will affect is my property value. If you look down on Main Street, and many of you have driven there, you'll see a large blue and white Victorian house surrounded by commercial properties. It's been for sale. I expect it'll stay for sale for quite a while. Unless they rezone that particular lot, commercial, <clears throat> residential, most people aren't going to want to buy that. So these are my main concerns with this. You know, I don't want to lose any more property. On the Westfield construction, I gave the city back to the right-of-way and where they would <clears throat> legally move their sidewalk back to the right-of-way. Things worked out pretty well there. I gave them an easement at the corner to make it ADA accessible. But I will not give up any property off of Oshkosh Avenue. I do not want a highway any closer in my front door. What, what is the city's plan for addressing some of these issues? <clears throat> We haven't answered yet, but thank you. Anyone else here speak to this item today? Okay, back to the commission. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Darren, it, to Dave's point, isn't that something that we can address in what we're doing right now with the land use maps that we're, we just had the meeting on last night? We, we talk, briefly talked about a little bit about that you know, the planning and, and looking at land use over the next 10, 15 years. And I'm wondering if we can't incorporate some of what Dave is getting at to in those land use maps and looking at changing those land use maps mm -hmm. that's coming up, that's going to be, that's part of the amendment to the comprehensive plan in that area and give us some, you know, give the planning department some time over the next few months to work with the, the consultant to, to do that and address Dave's idea because Dave's idea is very valid. Yeah, what I do mean, we, we do can with do those it. Points? We can do a holistic thing where we take, where we look at the whole corridor. We certainly can do that. And, and, I, and, and I'm not saying to, to hold up this. I'm saying I think that's more appropriate place to look at the continuing uh, all the way down to the to river as as David had, had, mm -hmm. had talked about. Sure. I mean, we've talked about doing uh, a corridor plan for Oshkosh Avenue. I think I even budgeted. I think I got in my proposed budget to do. Uh, but we're just not we're just not there yet. At this point, you know, we're reacting to a to a request. Right. Now the development is getting out ahead of where we are from a <coughs> planning from the planning standpoint. So if you could if you could relay that to East Central and, and discuss that with them, mm -hmm. see if maybe we can look at something that, that part of their their what the work that they're doing over these next final couple months that they're doing. They won't. They won't. It won't get to that level. That you, the, the minutia that you're talking about with a plan, that's a more detailed special area plan. What 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 um, what East Central is going to do is just going to be a general land use plan. You're going to see, you know, colors on on a map from. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. We, there's no reason why we can't put that as a general use and, and put that as as commercial in those air in, in that area. That's correct. But just again, it will take more. It, it's more fine. It's right. more minutia, uh, and I don't think. It, that's really something that should fall heavier, more heavy on planning staff because it's a smaller area. Okay. So, I mean, I think we can look at that and make some recommendations, but the, the, the best avenue is some type of corridor plan that takes all that into account. Okay. The future state of things, you know, the concern about the, the traffic on the road. Um, we have the same concerns about how much land that we potentially need dedicated from the parcels on the north side of the street to, to accommodate for some of the increased traffic that we're looking at in that area. Uh, but that all comes out of a, a, out of a special area plan. It's not going to come out of a comp plan, certainly, because a comp plan is, you know, 30,000 feet. The special area plan is sitting at 10,000 feet. So. All right. David? Oh, David and Kathy. And then right, just a follow-up to one response. Um, we, and I would take from our, maybe our previous conversation that this would be um, uh, maybe item, the next item. Uh, but the law of unintended consequences for the extended care uh, would be does it change does he or can that be one of the term one of the conditions that no no sex offenders can be in that uh, facility um, I we can check with we can certainly check with legal on that because we're not I mean at this point we have time because they're not proposing anything at this point, all we're, all we're proposing is a land use amendment and, and the zoning change. The development has to come back through, S, if, if it moves forward, has to come back through SIP or GDP SIP. 
So we still have time to, to look into those questions. Right now, that development that you're seeing up there is just, you know, we, we, we struggle with whether we should put them in, in or not, because it's not, a, it, 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 we're not, they're not moving forward with that yet. Uh, but, you know, you always ask, well, what do you want to do here? So that's, you know, we made them come up with a site plan to show, you know, what are, what are we looking at doing? Kathy and then Steve. Well, I understand um, why they're wanting a land use plan amendment to go to commercial. I, I can support that in theory. Uh, I see why we're doing it because those, those properties on the north side are just not doing well at all. Um, however, I'm going to say right now that I'm not happy with the concept plan for development that we're going to be voting on or looking at in the next one. So you're not. Can, and you're, no. just, you're not voting on a development. I know plan. I'm not. I'm, but okay. I'm tell, uh, I'm just saying that I'm willing to vote in favor of a commercial change in the land use. Mm -hmm. But then the next one is a whole other story. The next one is a zone change. Remember, it's only a zone change. It is not a development plan. Again, we're relating to a conceptual development plan that well, we are not reviewing. You're, what, what we're we'll doing? argue that in the next one. <laughs> okay. Well. Yeah, save I'm that argument worried. for next time. I just save your say voice. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Just want to make sure we understand we're voting only on change. Nothing to do with that development whatsoever. What he just said. Correct. Not yet. And the same thing is true in The next item is the same thing. Yep. It sets up for us to discuss this at a future time frame. But today, is your, it's just a concept showing this is what we want to do. It's not approving that plan at all. Go ahead. <clears throat> Are we rushing this through too quick? That's for us to decide, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting a vibe. But, uh, <clears throat> David. Well, and I think that, uh, to the mayor's point, um, how do we, you know, if we look at how the corridor study, if I understand uh, what um, the applicant has said, that, that, that this is pretty well drilled down. I mean, so they're ready for, you know, shovels in the ground. So I want to make sure that, that we as a city are prepared to address it. Or, and so what, what, is, what is the timeline? to make sure, uh, or the order of events, maybe that's a better way to put it, uh, that we can have in place what we expect of design standards and other, you know. Uh, well, that, I mean, our, our design standards right now are what, are what are in our zoning ordinance. I think our zoning ordinance is pretty good, but that doesn't accommodate everything. I think we did a good job because we adopted a lot of stuff from our Highway 41 corridor overlay that we incorporated in. But, um, if you're looking for anything more, uh, higher, higher standards, I, we're not going to be able to do that in, in a couple weeks. We just, we just, it won't happen. It's gonna and, and that's I mean, what is the timeline that, that you would need? Because I, uh, frankly, I feel that, that this is an opportunity for a holistic design for this corridor. I understand that it may, there may be you know different subsets within it, uh, but I, I would, I would, irrespective of what happens to the, the, the lake side of this property, that, that we want to make sure that, that what it looks like is of high quality and welcoming and the proper uh, uh, design and materials, whatever, uh, setbacks f and, and uses uh, for a gateway uh, development. Kathy, Ed, and then Jeff. Um, it, this discussion occurred to me that I think this is premature um, let's face it, Oshkosh Corporation is still on the table. I don't know how long that's going to take, but this really ought to be done in conjunction with whatever happens with that opportunity plan. Uh, then we've got the thing laid out. Then we haven't got that funny looking little stub of a street because we would have Northwest Field extended, no doubt. I mean, I'm assuming. Yeah. and. This all needs to be done in conjunction with that overarching issue, I think. I would, I would prefer to wait till, I don't know, mid-November or something, maybe even December, till we have some notion about what the Oshkosh Corporation. Okay, Ed, Jeff, and then Steve. Are. I mean, I, I guess my 
thought here is that we're putting a PD, SMU PD is, is the next item that we're talking about. I, I guess we have the ability to control what we're seeing here. And the likeliest timeline, I think, would probably put it in November before we're actually looking at anything along those lines, if it's even that. I mean, it may be December before we, we see a specific plan here. And the PD overlay certainly gives us the latitude to ensure that what we're looking at is what we need to see and what we want to see, I guess. We're not... We're not necessarily, I don't feel like we're backing ourselves into a corner by taking action on five. And I don't feel like we're backing ourselves into a corner by taking action on six. In, in fact, I think by taking action on six, we give ourselves more flexibility with what we want to implement down the line. And I think that it probably jibes with that timeline just from what I know about the process, I guess. So I, I have... I share Kathy's concerns from a basic level that we're not, you know, piecemealing things in a way that we can't come back from. But I don't feel like these two items necessarily put us in that in that position. There's a couple ways to handle it. Uh, those concerns. If the concern is we're moving too fast, um, we could, and we'll have to talk to the developer about this <coughs> at this point just to get their opinion. We could break this out into just doing the land use and then holding off on the zone change until the land use is actually accomplished because what's going to happen is the land use has to go back. We have to do a 30-day notice. So we're not looking at, I think we're looking at getting this thing done by council if it moves through uh, for the land use amendment sometime mid-November. Is that what I said, Steve? Do you remember that schedule? Yeah. So we were, we were scheduling it to get it accomplished sometime mid-November. So what we could do is get the land use amendment done and then come back and handle potentially handle the zone change and the SIP GDP at the same time, or GDP GDP first, and yes. then come back with the SIP. <coughs> that would be after the uh, after all likely after all these other decisions are being made. So you so what what we would be looking at right now to keep the ball rolling if we want to keep it moving forward is to uh, is to rec you know follow the recommendation for the change to the comp plan amendment. Uh, to uh, to a commercial classification, and then we can take up the discussion of if we're moving too fast with the zoning, and you can you could deny it. You can recommend that it be laid over for another meeting, table it until we get more information that you might have. But that's a, a discussion point for the next the next particular item. Jeff and then Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the zoning issue later. But uh, it, it, I don't want to get. To where we're actually I mean I understand looking at, at, at planning but you know to sit there and say hey what's going to happen north of, uh, uh, in, in, north of that property and, and hold this property up because of that doesn't make a lot of sense to me we do these kinds of things all the time you know we didn't have a total plan of what's going down around the arena when we decided to put in the arena that's still all kind of iffy as far as what's going to go all the way over to the river, all the way over to the Pioneer, but it didn't prevent us from doing that. And there's multiple examples where I can cite that we've done that over time. If it makes some sense to put the kind of development in the area, and this is a gateway corridor, so you're not going to be putting a lot of residential in your gateway corridors. It's going to be some kind of mixed use. It's right off the interstate. It makes more sense that there's a hotel there, that there's commercial buildings, that there's retail outlets, because it is right off the interstate. It is a gateway coming in. I don't think that, that identifying this land use as a commercial type land use, or even changing the zoning because it, it's within the, the, the land use, and putting the PD, which gives you a lot of latitude. I mean, you still have your underlying zoning which we just got done, uh, which is fairly substantial. And with the PD, we can actually put some more restrictions or some more design characteristics and things, but we have time to start this process. If we delay it, God knows government never gets things done in a few weeks. It's not going to get done. So saying delay it till November, then in November we'll be having the same discussion because it won't get done. It's going to take months, and to, to Darren's point and today's point, 
coming up with a corridor plan all the way down, that's going to take months. That's not weeks. That's months. You're lucky to get that done by this time next year. So I'm not opposed to changing the land use for this particular area because it makes sense to me. What's going in it may be a little different, and we'll discuss that, as Darren says. That's going to come back through here anyway. Just one point, uh, <laughs> Mark, just raise it, reinforce it. Uh, we wouldn't run. The, we wouldn't actually run that zone change uh, until to council until the comp plan is adopted. So, say we move forward with the item uh, and we move it forward, it's not like it's gonna. It's not gonna get ahead of the comprehensive plan amendment because we'll we'll wait to run that at council to <coughs> the comprehensive plan and amendment. Just just for a point of order, uh, clarification. Steve, uh, just one thing. Um, you know, this is a gateway. And we've been, criti we've been criticized about our other gateways. Ninth is no great shakes. Jackson no, is no great shakes. Here's our one chance to really do a top-notch job with a gateway into the city of Oshkosh. On the assumption that Op Oshkosh Corporation does acquire 30 acres, I think we have to look at what is appropriate as you approach a Fortune 500 company off the highway. You know, it also leads to, you know, Evergreen Manor, the Payne Arts Center, the museum, the university, into our central city. I mean, it would be the best gateway the city has. I think we have, ta we have talked for the years I've been on here about raising the bar. And stronger zoning uh, areas should be established, higher standards, again, approaching a five, Fortune 500 company and some of the major assets of this community. I think we need a higher uh, PD overlay. Um, th I think this is critical. I think architecturally, whatever goes here, if it does become commercial, the bar has to be raised. We just can't go with shoebox stores that look like Lego. My grandson can do better with Legos than I'm seeing here. It's gotta, it's gotta knock people's socks off, saying, wow, this is really a cool, awesome community. As they bring people in to interview, this will be their first exposure to Oshkosh, coming in Oshkosh Avenue. So I think we have to take a strong stand, and we have to finally put our money where our mouth is and raise all the standards, architecturally and everything else. And I don't think it's the time to just rush into something. David. Um, I agree with, with what the mayor said, uh, but I do think and if I understand the, if you will, the chicken and the egg, that the chicken comes first and, the, and this is this. Uh, the, it, it's this request. Um, I don't think that this request uh, is unreasonable, irrespective of what, whatever develop. This is the logical development for, for these parcels or these group of parcels. And I think that, uh, to the mayor's point, that if I understand some of our previous conversations, it's the next item where we're really going to look at how do we best affect uh, design standards and, and, and or even just begin to look at it because yeah. we don't have a specific plan yeah. in front of us yet. But but we, <clears throat> we I think that one of the things is we're going to be giving a pathway to the developer right. of of what our expectations are and what the expectations are of uh, his clients. So uh, I, w I, w I would make a motion for All right. accepted with acceptance. Recommendations and conditions. Second. Second. I think Jeff got it first. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, let's call the roll. Number five. Collins? Aye. Gins? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Crop? Aye. Feigert? Aye. Ford? Aye. Borsak? Aye. Bowen? Aye. Koytek? Aye. Motion carried 9-0. Okay, now I'm moving on to item <clears throat> number six. Okay. So now we're going to be talking the actual zoning designation, <coughs> excuse me, of seven of the parcels that we just discussed with the land use amendment. So petitioner is requesting a change from SR2 single family residential district to SMU planned unit development. Um, or suburban mixed use district with a plan unit development overlay for 1634 to 1746. 
So as we just discussed, this would kind of be the western seven parcels of the previous request. No land unit, uh, zone designation change would be proposed on the two existing single family homes. Those are not part of this request. Um, so we do again have some SMU zoning directly to the west of the property. To the north we have the institutional zoning for Mary Jewel Park and Lakeshore Municipal Golf Course. Uh, to the southeast we have some um, neighborhood mixed use zoning. That would be the child care center that was previously being discussed. And to the south we have a mixture of single family uh, zone districts. Uh, in total we're talking about approximately 6.4 acres of ground and again Oshkosh Avenue um, as of the 2013 data we had approximately 15,400 vehicles a day <clears throat> and is a designated truck route for truck traffic within the city so it is a pretty intense corridor so here's just an aerial of the property kind of shown a little close-up as we looked at before um, several of the parcels are vacant today the remaining homes that are shown within these seven properties are rental properties um, immediately to the west we do have some uh, commercial development and then again to the north the uh, golf course and the park so looking at this this is the generalized concept plan the developer has shown again this is only request to change the underlying zoning district to include commercial with a planned development the applicant would be required to come back for both a general development plan and specific implementation plan that could get into a lot of those um, additional development standards through the plan development that I think the mayor and some of you have uh, voiced concerns with. Um, to get the zoning started, we did request that they at least give us a generalized concept plan. But again, all the specifics would have to be brought back to this body and council before any type of development could go forward. Just looking at a very generalized timeline, which we discussed a little bit previously, if the zone change went forward as, as was previously voted on, it's looking at like a late November hearing before the council for the zone for the land use amendment. A zoning petition then requires two additional readings. So there'd be a reading in December and probably a reading in the first of January. So before a zoning could be in place, we're probably looking at January before the base zoning designation, if moved forward, would ever be in place. Then on top of that, you'd be looking at the additional time for any general development specific table uh, implementation plan. Just kind of give you a general timeline there. We can potentially run them at the same time we do it. Correct. You could potentially do some of those at the same time for the general and specific implementation plans. If this body or council chose to delay the underlying zone change, that underlying zone change in the future could be combined with the GDP SIP, just to kind of talk about timing. <coughs> um, staff is recommending. Um, approval of the zone change to suburban <coughs> use district, which is the same land use designation or zoning district we have to the west, and including the plan development overlay to give that additional flexibility in, in design standards and some of those things that um, can help ensure quality development. All right, thank you, sir. Let's start with technical questions and Jeffrey. Is there anything changing if we affect this zone change? Is there anything that adversely affects the two rental properties and or has those rental properties already agreed to be sold to the, to the developer? What are we talking about? Which ones? There's, there's ones. The, the rental properties that are up at the, that's part the of the, map. you go, go back, go to, back the map. to the map. There was two rental properties you said that was part of that? So I think those are owner occupied. These are owner occupied structures. Right. Not part of I'm not, yeah, I'm, yeah. Some of these homes that remain are, all of these sites are owned by a single owner. Yeah. And he does have rentals. Um, the uh, petitioners here, they can probably speak to was, the purchasing side of all right. If they, if they haven't agreed to purchase, is there anything about changing the zoning that adversely affects him as an owner of those properties? Because I know when we've done this before, there's been some issues about if it's in a commercial air territory, he tries to sell it again as a residential, they can't get financing, et cetera, so forth and so on. That's only when it's when it becomes a non-conforming use in that area, suburban mixed use. Does that? I'm not sure if that allows it or not. But uh, from the from the developer standpoint, the the developer and the 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 applicant and the owner are requesting the zone change. So they are requesting it because 
You know, they're trying to achieve something different. If something falls apart and they want to go back, then they'd have to change the zoning back to residential. At that point, we wouldn't be supportive of it because we we'd have, we'd have gone through the process of changing the comp plan from residential to commercial. All right. My next question, and this gets to what the mayor's point was. Uh, we've had PDs in the past, and we have been apprehensive about putting more strict standards on a lot of our PDs. We pretty much rely to the underlying zoning, and we put a couple little things in there. Usually it's to reduce setbacks or something of that nature. And we have done very, very little about imposing a higher design standard. It's just not been our appetite to do. So. My question is, and to the mayor's point, how do we, by just designating in the PD, what steps are going to be made so that the developer understands what we want to get done? I mean, the only one that I remember that we did was the city garage that where we actually put some, some, some standards on there to make the building look the way we want it to do and we've done very little at anywhere else I'm not saying we haven't done some but we have but very little especially in this area where we're expecting a little bit higher development and it does the developer know that his cost per structure may be higher than anticipated because of what we're wanting to do to improve this as a gateway area to the mayor's point yeah which I'm also strongly in favor of but we have not shown an appetite to do that through PD uh, no, uh, we, development. We have done it and it, sometimes that was relating to what the request of the PD was. If they were asking for a lot of base standard modifications, general, a lot of times we related that uh, the, uh, the conditions that we imposed to that request for additional setbacks. So if they wanted if they wanted lesser setbacks we said increase the increase the landscaping in this area. So that's generally how we've applied it. You're right, we haven't been overly aggressive in that regard, and uh, David's pushed, you've pushed. Um, you know, we were talking about this issue today about the whole quality issue and and can, is the PD, does that give us the most protection in, in, in this <coughs> instant? We, 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 we think the PD provides us a pretty good level of protection, but uh, we were talking about today and we think that potentially if we want to go that route, we think that Instead of a suburban mixed use, uh, that a business park, uh, a BP zone would give us a little bit more flexibility in that regard, uh, because within the within the business park zoning, uh, it's not uh, the the gas station is not allowed use, so uh, so we could use the base standard modification through the PD to allow a gas station, and that's where you could that's where you could uh, get those additional architectural. Um, standards so, that you want. So are we premature on this yes, particular designation I don't know. And, and being able to I sit down further with with the developer and let them understand what we're, ex we're expecting and that you know we may be imposing much more architectural details and stuff than they may be willing to do because of its cost effectiveness. I, you know that and again that's for you guys to decide where I'm laying we're laying out a scenario that if, if there's a concern about the quality, that we think that the be, the better underlying zoning is a business park zoning, if that's your concern. Uh, SMU, we think we can still get it through the plan development, but we think it's a it, we think that the business park gives us that flexibility to negotiate directly with a developer to, to try and ensure that quality. What's the difference between a business park, I assume with with a PD? The uses that are allowed, yep. such as. Uh, business park zoning. He's, he's he's looking at putting the, the the extended stay hotel. That would be a conditional use in that district. Right now, the gas station is not a, is not permitted in that district. So the things that you're talking about here is you put a business park PD, but because uh, it doesn't allow, mm -hmm. you'd have to come back through the conditional use permit, which is going to give us a little bit more latitude to impose different architectural there's more Yes, there's more negotiating as part of that plan development because what you're requesting is, you're requesting to put a use in that district that doesn't meet the underlying standard of that district or the primitive use of the district. So you're asking for a lot from the community. You're asking for a lot from the community to change its use. So the community, on the other hand, is asking, we want some of these architectural considerations but to aren't, up for that. Aren't we then 
if we do that, aren't we now mixing, you know, we have SMU yes, to, we to, to, to the west. I'm not sure uh, what would happen uh, if the Oshkosh truck uh, went through. Would that be a business park designation or would it be an SMU designation? It'd be a it'd be it'd be a it'd be a business park designation, and the appropriate designation based on some of our comments and some of the concerns for this whole corridor uh, to you get at some of this is business park. Okay. With the PD. Okay. David, Kathy, and then Steve. Okay. Um, I think this this sort of highlights my original comments, um, observations, and if we just forget what goes east of Mary Jewel Park for the moment, but going to the west. I think what we what we need is is not well we'll, we'll have design standards for for the property in question but but if I look at the property to the west immediately to the west there is no I, I'm not sure what the zoning is there oh, but PD. It, everything everything is PD'd up until uh, two brothers in Lakinta. okay I, I would suggest that all that be rezoned uh, to business park and that we develop design standards so that every Every remodeling or every change, every sign change, uh, is that it, there's a consistency, and that the, and that all these properties are developed uniformly, or that within the, within the same design characteristics. And I can think from whether it's pi, re, you know, whether it's pylon signs, building exteriors, degree of, of, of landscape, you know, the the things that we're trying to trying to accomplish. I would add just to interject. Oshkosh or no Oshkosh, that's a good good idea. Yeah, and, and I agree with, it. and I'm sorry that I that 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 this was irrespective of what uh, would ever right. develop with the golf course. Kathy, and then Steve. Um, it occurred to me that we are in technical questions and we're getting into debate on it, but that's okay because we want the developer to re be able to respond. But I like the con. I like. I think we are premature. I would after we hear from people propose to lay this over so that we can discuss the business park zoning and whether we can apply it along along the whole area and I also don't want to vote on this today um, with the concept plan that we have here I cannot support that concept plan and I don't want it a vote for the zone be noted as a vote for the concept plan so that's, I shouldn't have said that now, but the developer knows now how we know. to feel. Steve. I would agree with Kathy. I think we should either lay this over. I think there's a lot of, a lot of things have been discussed. We've got the people here from House and Levine uh, bounce this off of them. I think this is our chance to really make order into this city outstanding. We're kind of starting from a little bit from scratch. We've got a kind of an open palette here. Let's do it right. Let's finally keep our stand. We've always talked about higher standards. Let's do it. I, I think we'll be sorry in 25. If we just, you know, we can't accept C. Let's go for A plus. All right. Any other tactical questions, David? Yeah. What, how long would it take for staff to come back to us to try to give us some kind of a, a body? You know, if we're is this a layover? I guess that two weeks is not reasonable. I would think that is a month a reasonable time to really to have an adequate uh, response to this item to us. Uh, at least to the twenty. Uh, what's what's the second meeting? In November the seventh. The one and seventh is already packed. Twenty first. So we'd be looking at twenty first for for probably so we can get something accomplished in in that time frame with respect to how many parcels we should be changing, potential design standards. But even, the, even at that point, I don't think I'd want to take it as an actionable item. I'd want to workshop that uh, to come up with some recommendations for what. Okay. So I don't is that six, I don't is that six to weeks? I, I'm a little bad with my, or three meetings? It's uh, two meetings. Two meetings. From the public. second meeting. It's a month, just over <clears throat> five months. Two meetings. It, it, I, I would prefer that it be a, a workshop. Um, I would not want to propose a zone, a broader zone change for that area without having, you know, all those all those potential design standards and other issues that you're talking about. We have to do some research on what other communities have done. I don't think it's not. It's certainly not time. Certainly not enough time for us to do a decent regulating plan for that area. But if I understand, if if we in two meetings you could we could have a workshop. 
in three yes. meetings we would have something to bring back on the table. Sure. So I, w I would. We have to hear from the. We're, we're, we're still at technical okay. questions. Okay. Hector, you know if we need to open it up. We need to open it up no. at some point. Okay. All right. Any more technical questions? Seeing none, anyone here from the audience to speak to this yeah. item today? Yeah. We've given you much to chew on. Come on up, ma'am. My name is Barbara Mand, and we own the property at 1610 Oshkosh Avenue, and that's <clears> why we're <throat> extremely interested in what your thoughts are. We're right next to the Muir Drill. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, we're willing to go along with most anything that you come up with, but that is our property, and we are also in a problem that the city is requiring that we put new water lines in because uh, we're lead, and I'm kind of fighting that a little bit because it's going to be $5,000 about, about, and if we're just sitting on an island there. So that's what our interest is in you guys talking about where we're going to end up with this. So any input would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? Okay, public comment is closed. Back to the commission. Yeah, why, why don't we, well, I mean, <coughs> Steve, yeah. why don't you, uh, there's, this is all impacting your proposal. Based on what you've heard with this discussion, <clears throat> what are your thoughts? Um, it will be very difficult to proceed with the timetable that we've got if it's delayed three weeks from this, uh, uh, or three meetings from now um, we've been under a timetable we would like to get the hotel open by EAA and uh, and get part of the summer at least uh, into the hotel um, so that's uh, pretty much completely throws everything out of out of whack so well, the one thing Steve you, you still haven't submitted for the SIP uh, and the GDP enter the plan development so you could I mean we could still accomplish something in the the original time frame, I think you had it for the GDP SIP sometime in December, January ish. So it could still, we theoretically, we could still meet that uh, potential time frame. But yeah, it's going to push mm -hmm. it out. The, the final approval potentially of that GDP SIP, or at least the GDP, is going to be sometime in January. But Jeff, but Darren, Darren, the, we have to oh. address the petitioner. I'm asking a question of Darren, okay. and I'll address the petitioner okay. after, so give me some time. Okay. Easy, Jeff. Darren, uh, um, you haven't had any discussions at all regarding the, the, the type of stand, design standards we'd be looking at. So, I mean, yeah. th that's something that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. And I guess my question to the petitioner is, you know, this just kind of came up, <clears throat> that depending on what the hotel is, we may be requiring more aesthetic appeal onto that hotel, thus costing you more. And the same thing with the rest of those developments because they're not going to be standard buildings that pretty much you see here in Oshkosh. There may be something that we don't know of yet. Well, let me, and let me ask Steve real quick. Steve, have you looked at our design standards? Uh, um, our yeah, design yeah, I'm, standards? I'm very familiar with it. We're talking brick and stucco already. I mean, we're not talking, um, it'll be a, a, a B plus to an A minus uh, level facility for the, the front development. We really aren't sure yet what we're going to be doing, if it's going to be retail, commercial, office, whatever. I mean, that's That'll be a whole other, you know, scenario when we come in to do that. Really, right now we're looking at the gas station and the and the extended stay hotel. But I, I guess what I'd be looking at is if we went forward with the the, the other proposed, you know, a potential project north, which is an A type building. Mm -hmm. You're going to expect that the buildings around that are going to be very close to an A. -type right, and we're building. taking that into consideration right now. Okay. So yeah, definitely. All right, thank you. Other questions for the petitioner or other thoughts that you may have? Steve? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, back to the commission for discussion and whatever we decide to do. David and then Kevin. Um, I don't, uh, 
time may be somewhat of the essence uh, for, for the developer. That being said, uh, as, as you know, the, the mayor has really succinctly put that this is our one opportunity. And uh, if, if that development makes sense, that type of, of facilities in that development, uh, I have a real challenge that several weeks yeah. is, is going to make a significant difference uh, in, in the total scope of things. And while it may, I understand the challenge perhaps for the, uh, for the hotel, uh, certainly not if we were to elect to, to allow a gas station there. Uh, what the you know what that was really going to look like uh, so if, if I understand what what staff can do I would like to suggest or if appropriate make a motion that we lay over for three meetings and that but parenthetically in the second in, in two meetings they had uh, that staff come back to us with the <coughs> uh, uh, zoning and design standards uh, for the corridor from the from I-41 to Mary Jewel Park. So you're moving to lay it over. Add second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to lay this over for three meetings based on the time. Sure. We got it. Discussion on a motion caddying. Um, three meetings or just lay it over. Until such time. Until. I mean, you know, time is of the essence for the developer, but lay it over to an appropriate time. Well, let, let's we can lay it over. It doesn't mean we. I mean, we'll get as far as we can by that layover meeting. We'll okay. get you as much as we can, as much as our work capacity allows, and we'll make it. A, and if we need to lay it over again for a couple of meetings, we'll have to lay it over again. Our our intent would be to get as <coughs> much as you can, or as much as we can get to you, so you can make a decision at that meeting. We don't like to lay things over and keep laying them over. So we'll, right. we'll, we'll get as far as we can to that meeting. Okay. And then well, we'll the layover is for three weeks, but in two weeks you're having a workshop. Uh, we're two meetings. Two meetings. Three, 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 excuse meetings. me. Two the third, the third, third meeting, yeah. you'll have the, the bring back the zoning. Yeah. But so the second meeting we have the workshop. That's so great. the idea would hopefully we'd be able to make a decision in that first meeting in December. Okay. And by that time, Stephen, this is good. By that time, hopefully... The land use amendment for the for the commercial will have been approved by the council, so the so the so the, so that will be in place, and then we're just looking at uh, the the we're looking at the GDP SIP and the zoning. Okay. All right. Further discussion on the motion. Seeing none, let's call the roll. Holmes. Aye. What was that? Yes. Aye. Cummings. I'm sorry, he left. Brock? Aye. Kiefer? Aye. Bigert? Aye. Ford? Aye. Borsak? Aye. Bowen? Aye. Bortek? Aye. Motion carried 9 0. All right, moving back to item number two, architectural building plan review for a proposed sanitary lift station at 1507 North Eagle Street in Mary Jewel Park. Now it's my turn to get obnoxious. <laughs> Never. This one should be easy. No, I never say that. I'm kidding. Never I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, the applicant is requesting an architectural building plan review for construction of a sanitary lift station, um, which will be located at Mary Jewel Park. Uh, the subject site is located along North Eagle Street, north of Oshkosh Ave. Uh, it is currently used for Mary Jewel Park and Lakeshore uh, Municipal Golf Course to the north. Uh, the project area is surrounded primarily by residential uses as well as the Lakeshore Golf Course to the north. So here's where the proposed site is for the lift station. Um, the structure is a pump house along with an attached park shelter and driveway. Uh, the structure will be located on the eastern portion of the park along North Eagle Street between the baseball field and golf course. Uh, the pump house and park shelter is planned to be uh, 2,371 square feet in floor area along with uh, pavement uh, generally located to the south and east of the building. Uh, the park shelter area will be attached uh, to the building on the south side facing the baseball field. 
And here are the uh, elevations. Uh, the architectural features of the building will generally match the materials and colors of the newly constructed restroom facilities at Boatworks Riverwalk and Stevens Park. Uh, the finished material for the structure is six inch horizontal fiber cement siding along with split face uh, concrete masonry unit. The roof will be partially supported by several eight inch by eight inch Douglas fir columns and will have a standing seam metal roof system. On the left we have the view from the north and on the right is the view from the south. Uh, staff believes that the pump station and park shelter will not have a negative impact on the surrounding area as the structure will be harmonious with the intended character of the general vicinity and sufficient facade articulation will be provided and the proposed structure is consistent in style and materials with uh, similar pub public buildings in the city. And staff recommends approval of the architectural design of the proposed sanitary lift station as proposed. All right, technical questions, David. Um, what were the what were the design guide guidelines that were given to AECOM to come up with this structure? We'll refer that back. Steve Gordy is here. He's we coordinated with Parks Department as this isn't a park and it was designed to be similar to the other park facility structures that they've re recently constructed in South Park, Stevens Park. Menominee Park, I believe, are the three, <clears throat> and it's uh, meant to be similar to that design, so they're a, a uniform throughout the city. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm frustrated. And I'm not sure when we're going to get to this, but uh, because I don't, I, I'm just going to say instead, I'm not going to recommend that that we vote against. I I I, I recommend that we lay this over as in, as far out as we can and have it Absolutely. redesigned and not even. I mean, this is really an embarrassment, and especially what we're looking at uh, as as design standards for uh, the commercial development in this corridor. Uh, this doesn't even come close. And what brought us even to the fact of having review of these these facilities was the fact that these facilities were were inadequate and what and what was at it near the boatworks property and this, this sort of cookie cutter uh, lack of lack of detail and in, in, in design uh, but how long can, just as a technical how long can you lay something over without uh, taking action mm, the way it's it's morning. Morning. Bid opening this morning I, I let me I it's, there's something on code we have a uh, I don't think there's actual time frame that we have on an architectural review. We have, we have prescribed timelines for conditional uses, zone changes, and all that. I don't think we have a prescribed timeline for uh, architectural review. There are some things in the state statute that the Planning Commission has to make a decision within X amount of days or, get, or, it's, or it's, it's considered approved before it goes to council. I don't have the statute in front of me right now. So can I can't can somebody you. find out because that's at the end of the day is what I'm, I want to delay this as possible without a recommendation and have them come back and redesign this thing. Okay, Jeff and then John. Well, we're, I'm thinking we can delay it for at least the, the, the next two weeks until they can find out that answer. Then we can take action because if the last two items were premature, this is definitely premature. Well, and the other guidance that we're going to need, if we're going to lay this over, it's got to be, there's got to be some specific um, reasoning for things that, we need to look at to potentially <coughs> improve this, change it. What, you know, if you, if we're just laying it over, we need to know what we're supposed to be looking at. Okay, you can't just say make it better. <laughs> yeah, no, we no I understand. <laughs> I, 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 uh, uh, um, then, it'll be the same. It better. <coughs> better than an engineer's eye or an architect's. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there's there's. Let engineers at it. Mm -hmm. uh, John and Kathy. Um, Steve, quick question for you: How far from home plate is that concrete? It is outside of the outfield fence. Yeah, just that. Ah, just saying, twelve-year-old kids can hit the ball. It, it, it's out. It's outside the, the fencing that's out there. <laughs> With the round of bats. They're on the juice now. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. <laughs> anybody watch? Anybody watch the Little League World Series? Those are just normal kids <laughs> hitting. This is a larger but, field. This right. Up. Right. But, field, so this is a um, yeah. Just, just really saying, they're poking them out there. It's going to be. In concrete, if they hit it on the fly, going into the building. <clears throat> that's that's my point. Yeah. <laughs> my turn. Yeah. Um, Steve, didn't I see on the board downstairs that there was a bid opening this morning? Yes, you did. 
And now we're at being asked to vote on it, and we're, we're really randy today, people. I'm sorry, but <laughs> we're all re revved up today. Um, so that, of course, complicates it. Also, I want to, uh, obviously, the, the reason we're doing this is the sanitary lift station. Correct. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. Correct. And I presume that needs to be done. We have a situation where we had to replace the sanitary sewer that was on pilings through Sawyer Creek uh, that was actually creating a dam that was discovered <coughs> during the dredging project back in 2012. So we had to put a temporary a temporary siphon underneath the creek. Uh, we were forced to downsize that because of some DNR permitting issues. Uh, it essentially is about, at the overflow elevations, about this far below some of the upstream basement elevations. So we need to get this replaced to stop having that risk and high maintenance item for backups into those houses, yes. Yeah, so, so it's something that needs to be done. I don't think we can lay it over indefinitely. <laughs> Correct. At yes, all. I, we need to push to have this project move um, forward. I share David's concern, and we can talk about the architecture part when we get to the plan commission's discussion. All right. David? Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Anybody else technical questions? Oh, I, Ed. I'm this was in the CIP, right? Yes, it was in the this 2017 CIP. Because I, I remember reviewing this as part of the CIP, kind of having the same questions, trying to figure out where you guys were going to put this station, so. David. Uh, and I, now I know it's, it's a timing issue. If we knew that this was proposed and, the, and, and these were the, this design was in the plans and specifications uh, of what, what the building was bid, uh, bid on and it was open today, why are we first seeing it today and we didn't see it when, when you were preparing the bid package for the bid? So, I mean, the, the the timing is wrong, and and I and I and I, I'm unclear why you would put us in this position when when uh, certainly the parks department has been had been put on notice uh, about you know the overviews and the concerns we have, and and somebody from your department has, has always been at these meetings. What why? Uh, uh, I mean, this this is this is sequentially is incorrect. Frankly, I, I wasn't aware that the Planning Commission had issues with the current restroom design. We thought that, that following that would be a, a well well received as um, they were in the other ones. So that lack of information on our part there. And as far as the timing, I'm not sure what delayed the application getting in to get onto this meeting. I have to check with our consultant. But, see. I mean, we should have seen this a month ago or two and, months and that's, ago. I, that's why I said I need to check with our consultant. Or when it was designed. Yeah, the designs were just finished up recently because of some changes, but uh, I'm not sure what the delay was in getting it on the plan commission agenda. Other tactical questions? All right. Anyone here from the public to speak to this item before we really go at it? Come on up, ma'am. Lucinda Porter from 81 Myrna Jane Drive in Oshkosh. Um, if you've ever needed a lift station, which I have, you want it immediately. Because <laughs> I can't remember how many times I've had flooding and have had to come to this building to talk about. And it was a city issue, not my house issue. So the city is paying for this building, correct? I mean, how fancy does it need to be? If it looks like a park structure, I can't imagine what would be wrong with that. It's not a building that people are going to be visiting or buying things from. It's not going to be highly visible. It's going to be behind the fence of the ball field. I think you would want it structurally sound, so in case a ball does go over there, it's not breaking stuff. Um, but I understand the need for them, and I'm, I didn't even know about this. This wasn't even why I was here today. <laughs> but I'm hoping you can approve as fast as I can because I've had so much flooding, so I, I totally understand that. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? Okay, seeing none, back to the commission. Gaddy. David's right. <laughs> um, I went out there today to look at it with uh, my hair on fire, and I calmed down a little bit <laughs> because it's way back on North Eagle. It's, it's all, as a matter of fact, it's practically on the golf course tee, but that's okay. We aren't going to have a golf course anyway, probably, so 
you know, that's not as important. Um, I think the, what we should do is require more shrubs, landscaping along the east side, because the neighbors have to look at that thing. And so I, I don't think it's oh. as close to Oshkosh Ave as I thought it might be in terms of gateway standards. Uh, it's back a little bit. It is behind the ballpark. Uh, but at a minimum, we should require more shrubbery. Jeff? I guess I, I, I look at it as if the property to the north, the Lakeshore Golf Course was developed, would this be the kind of structure that you would want in that area? And my answer is no, because again, you're trying to make that area a class A area, a gateway. You can't see it to Kathy's point. I get that, but the, the people that are going to be using that park, because a lot of that land is proposed to still be park, this wouldn't be the structure we would want to have. And we've talked about that before, even though we've approved them in, okay. in, in other parks. That probably is not the structure that you would want, especially when we're ta just talking about elevating design standards for developers and stuff, and then we go and put the same type of structure that we always put in the same location, and we're asking the developer to step up our game. It would make a lot of sense to me. All right. The city I needs agree. to step up their game too. So. I would propose to, to, to hold off on this for a period of time until we know sort of what the direction is going to be with that whole area. Now, having said that, you'd still probably want to try and change some of the way the structure looks uh, as we go forward in new parks or when we redevelop, you know, facilities in, the, in, in older parks that we need to, to, to make it look more aesthetically appealing to the public. David? Um, not sure in uh, understanding you know the timelines and the bid the bid pro process in this particular project the, I, the linear would be that this be included in in our meet, our, our meeting dis workshop discussion in two weeks or in two meetings and bring it back in three weeks if it can't uh, it, if we can come up something, or if there's going to have to be a separate, you know, stream of consciousness where you think you're going, and we could we could lay uh, if they could come back in two weeks with a re in two meetings in a redesign, uh, because you'd give you some idea of what we're looking at, you know, at design standards. But I am not comfortable making any recommendation as it's presented right now, and, and my my thought process would be lay either a layover for two meetings or three meetings. John? It's my understanding that this uh, structure is also going to serve for bathrooms for the baseball field and for the mm -hmm. trail system that um, is proposed to be in this area regardless of what's done with Lakeshore Golf Course. Um, so again, how, how does that all play out? What design? Where is it going to be? I know that area is notoriously wet. I know there's some uh, drainage areas that are put in here. But is that going to, you know, there's many games that we played with huge mud puddles out in the right field area, um, and that extends all the way over to this area. So what's the whole plan for development? I mean, are we just going to throw this lift station in there and throw some bathrooms in there, have a little bit of a shelter area? Um, or should we be doing this on a more grand scale, looking at what the needs are for the, the baseball diamond, assuming that it's going to stay there? Um, and, you know, the, the, the trail system uh, as a trail head, you know, is there, you know, could there be additional parking put in there? There's more parking needed for the baseball field. Um, the baseball field there is the one and only uh, Pony League style field that we have here in Oshkosh, the one and only. Um, so it's used extensively, you know, by that certain age group. Um, and, you know, so if we're going to do something with that area, let's do it on a, on a grand scale mm -hmm. here. Let's, let's make sure we have it all planned out and look at you know, the future of what we're going to have here. So not just throw a lift station in there and, and then build around it. So thank you, John. Well, John those, and let me just yeah. respond a little bit. John, those are all great questions. Those are all things that need to be asked. The scope, the particular scope of this request is an architectural review. That's the, that's the scope that's coming in. It's not a plan development. It's not a conditional use permit. It's simply an architectural review. Uh, that's, what, that's what we're prescribed to do under the statutes. 
So that's really what, those are all questions that need to be asked. Parks, anybody who has control of that land needs to be asking the questions that you just asked for our scope, which is a more limited scope. Basically, we're just asking is those architectural plans that you see up there, what do you like about them? <laughs> which is, <laughs> we don't which like is them. I can tell, <laughs> yes. Uh, so if we're gonna, you know, if you're gonna lay this over, because there's, there's only so many times you can lay it over, um, and I, I'll get the legal opinion on that, David. Um, we need some guidance. So if you don't like something, we need to know. It's, it's tough to say and just start over. Um, is, there any, is there any good constructive criticism that we can have of this particular request? It, it's him up very of? quickly. Let's start with him. How about some more dormers? They might be fake, but throw some more dormers on there. Use a more uh, attractive, decorative CMU as opposed to the stock uh, sort of knee wall CMU banding around there. Uh, maybe put some spandrel glass windows in there to, to mimic uh, an actual operating structure, understanding that you don't actually want windows into a lift station or a bathroom. Um, I mean, I, that's kind I, of I'm going to I'm going to express an unpopular opinion here very clearly that I don't find this building that objectionable compared to other. Steve, you have you have a lot of lovely structures within your portfolio. <laughs> I guess <laughs> this is not. This is by far the worst one. I, I think this is this is light years ahead of of the monstrosity that got constructed in Menominee Park uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago or seven or eight years ago, whatever that was. Which we talked about a lot. Which we know. talked about a lot. Damn. Which we talked about a lot. And and in retrospect, we kind of screwed that one up. I think that that's my opinion. Um, but I don't have a major objection to this other than. You're using some pretty boring stock materials. There's a lot of flat roof line uh, that could be broken up with some, some more decorative elements. I like the, the detailing on the gable ends. I like the, the use of the, the, uh, the Douglas fir columns that they're mentioning. I mean, I, what do we want? I mean, at the end of the day, what are we trying to get these guys to build here and how much are we trying to get them to spend on, on doing it? I understand that to some degree the budget is, is luckily Steve's problem and not ours, but at the end of the day, there's, there's not that much more that can be done with this type of structure. I mean, do we want to you know, make it mixed use? Do we want to, like, what are, we, what are we trying to do? Like, that, that's why, so those are my items of input. Those are some fairly simple things that can be done from an architectural standpoint that could maybe upgrade it a little bit without maybe derailing the entire sort of sanitary sewer process. David. Um, did, did the Parks Department or the Parks Board you review this? I, Steve says <clears throat> yes. He's shaking his head yes. And they had no concerns? They've been building these. The, well, the Parks Board, we, went, we met with them. We went over the location. The location was uh, partially driven by the need to save the oak trees on the east side of it. That's why it is where it's at for the screening that you'd mentioned. So we're trying to preserve as many of those oak trees as we can. I believe there's one that's coming out because it's already in very, if not dead, very decaying condition. Um, but they were happy with that because it matches their other buildings that they're being constructed throughout the city <laughs> on their... <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, thank you. L l let me just finish. Okay, go ahead. That, Kathy and you know, and, and, and you know, I'm not sure how you know. It's sort of like p pornography. I'm not sure what it is, but I know what it is when I don't like it. Um, this is get that in a note, step. This is <laughs> you know, this is terrible. One, yeah. This is so industrial looking, and really looks cheap. You know, it, it's just it's. I haven't seen enough. Uh, uh, park shelters and bathrooms that, oh, by the way, are a lift station, uh, you know, to, to look at it. But it, there, there's absolutely no imagination in this thing. And it, it, it's, if it wasn't for the, oh, by the way, we'll have the, 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 the uh, roof line extended out a little bit so that you have uh, a, a covered area, uh, uh, you know, it, this building looks like it was designed by an engineer. 
Um, it was. It was. <laughs> That's my point. So cut him some slack a little bit. I mean, I mean, some, co- no, I mean some feedback, like, yeah, David. Kathy, some Kathy, you have some feedback? Yeah. yeah. Um, shrubbery. Engineer, he needs it. A lot more shrubbery around it. Uh, that would help. Um, I'll go with... Uh, your uh, idea, Ed, of you know various materials and stuff. I don't know what materials we want, you know, but it can only be better. And this is this is the stock bathroom that the parks people have been building. They're happy with it, <laughs> you know. And we aren't, <laughs> but we're in charge of pretty, and they aren't. So, and appropriate in this part. I would I would like to see it upgraded a little bit. And I don't know how much it would cost to put some lipstick on the pig. But we do need this lift station. I'm not not sure we can be, you know, forcing around that long. Jeff and then John. Yeah, I you am know, Darren, you're saying we we have to look at the architectural design mm-hmm. and I don't know Ed's about as close as the architect that we're gonna have on this committee. I'm not an architect, but you know, like she said, I could put lipstick on a pig, and and that doesn't even get to a pig status. Um, you know, I look at and, and we're, we're going to be talking about Imagine Oshkosh, and hopefully people will read through this thing and see that there are other things that we can do to make things look aesthetically appealing. Some of the stuff that Ed talked about. How I'm even looking at, you know, you paint one of the walls with a ball diamond on one of the the walls or you know kids you know on the wall or something like that that kind of meets some of the things that they were talking about in the Imagine Oshkosh not doing the same thing that we've done for a hundred years and we still and we complain about these buildings all the time but if we're going to expect developers to do what's in this book then by gosh we ought to start setting an example and doing it ourselves and that's what I'm asking to do. People that use these parks, it's one thing to be functional, but it should also be aesthetically appealing so that they enjoy the entire experience. And part of going to, to the restrooms and stuff is part of that experience. It shouldn't be say, oh my God, I have to go there, <laughs> you know, type of situation. It should be, you know, that it's, it's got some, some niceties about it. And that's all I'm kind of saying as far as this goes regardless of what happens you know it, with Lakeshore it, it doesn't matter it matters what yeah. we're going to be talking about in here and this is you know the first step to starting to do some of that stuff so that we can then go to the developer and say hey we're walking the walk we need you to walk the walk John yeah and kind of going along with that Michael. and to, with like some of the things that Ed brought up you know just just that that ground wall being a different color it's like a monochromatic gray <laughs> that's what you're looking at as a pile of gray. And I think that's what's where David is talking about when you see it, you, you, you know it, but you don't know what you're seeing. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing is we're just seeing this gray building. And, every, you know, and everybody's talking, you know, Jeff talks about having a ball diamond type of mural or something on a wall and changing the ground, the ground wall, maybe adding a gable or two. That's all, those are all things. Don't bring us something that's just one color. Using some mosaics. Using yeah, some, just, you know, yeah. All, all sorts of different things you can do. Mike and then David. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of the fact that it's a bathroom and a lift station. Um, I, I don't disagree with what I, anything that's been said here, but I don't think this is the particular building to make our stand in terms of um, being pretty. Um, but I do think that the ideas that were floating around here strike me as logical and pretty small and pretty easy to do to make it more attractive. David? Um, the editorial is, uh, I think that because we're looking at the development of this area, that I think that this this is m- perhaps more appropriately uh, where where we we challenge the the city. Um, uh, but I would ask, and maybe it's it's Steve or if somebody is here from AECOM, they have they hear the stream of consciousness, is how long is it going to take them to come back, uh, at w- 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 with 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 Two some weeks idea. of a different paint job. Oh, wait, wait, hold on, we have somebody from ACOM. Right. Paul Tim from ACOM, Mosh Gosh office. So I'm kind of responsible for some of the things here. Right. <laughs> I've been listening, mostly taking lot. notes, taking notes. Um, the direction that was provided by the engineering staff, parks staff we worked with, they come up with a similar design uh, that you see before you as the restrooms, there, boat works and everything. 
Um, we're hiding a sanitary lift station in this structure. There's only so many things we can do. Um, Snell Road lift station is a more a typical example of what a sanitary lift station looks like. It's a block building, flat roof. It's got a specific design purpose. At this particular location, we're trying to combine a mixed use idea with some restrooms with the <clears> park <throat> environment. And I guess the direction was to come up with this look. Your question is, what can we do to change it? I guess I need some guidelines to what you want. There's a lot of things we can do. Each one has dollar signs associated with it. Um, right now, as far as the budgets, and this may not be, like you said, it's in Steve's deal, our budgets are uh, right at what the maximum is allowed for the CIP to get this project constructed. And yes, the project was open this morning, and it was a fast-track design. That's why it did not get to you guys within the last couple of months. So I apologize for that, but when we're doing the engineering things, it takes a lot of time to get to the point where it's ready for public consumption. David. And it's not, uh, thank you. Uh, at yeah. least you answered my, you know, part of my question. But what you said is, is deeply disturbing because when we looked at the Boltworks site, that was it. That was the last straw, if I remember correctly, our discussions. And when we asked for a higher level of, of, uh, of design and uh, but that's not his problem I, no but it is part no yeah. it's not his problem but it is what, what I find uh, disturbing is that we made that known to the parks department we made it to the city departments and why that wasn't followed I mean there, there, there's something that that's incorrect and and I don't understand fast track uh, but maybe what you ought to come back to is just a lift station and forget everything and and, and and we'll hide that and forget about the bathrooms and all that. And we don't have to worry about some of this goofy, you know, this, this parks building, uh, uh, you know, no, maybe that's, and that maybe that's the alternative. But uh, listen to the process here. I mean, it's like uh, the rest of the, you know, that we're, we're in a vacuum, that, that people aren't listening to direction. And I, I don't understand how Parks and engineering and whatever did not hear that message. And I don't think that we should allow that to happen, especially when we're looking at a gateway area. I mean, we just, uh, we put the developer on notice on, on, on the direct frontage that we expect high grade developments. If, if there is further development within, or whatever the further development is, uh, in, in Lakeshore Golf Course, we should expect the same of the city. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a systemic problem here, and I'm not sure what it is. And, and uh, in any event, I, can't, I, I think that, that, that this really enforces that the city has to come back and, and understand that they made an error, that there was an error in judgment, an error in listening and that they need to uh, come back with a, re a total a redesign of this facility. Jeff. Well, and perhaps the, the issue is, because again, this gentleman was given certain criteria, right. is that we do not have design standards for these. <clears throat> you know, like you said, the, the lift station is a block building with a flat roof. Why? Why does a lift station have to look like a lift station? It doesn't. Why, you know, it looks why like does a, a, a restroom okay. have to look like a restroom? It doesn't necessarily have to. Why can't we alter materials? We did that with this. Remember, the, the, those of us who were here, what the first um, city garage look, plan looked like. And we mm -hmm. said, absolutely not. And they got that message, I think. You'll, but it you'll still looks agree. like a garage. It, it does, but it's aesthetically Sorry. appealing because we changed the, the color, we changed the articulations on the walls that don't take a whole heck of a lot to get there. But we changed you know, the, the, the color and stuff, and it actually looks nice. It looks like it would have been part of a college campus type building. And to Kathy's point, they did something with, arc, with, with, with um, um, landscaping we we put iron rock fences now I'm not saying to, to, to do those kinds of things 
But I'm saying that maybe we ought to come up, maybe it's shame on us for not having design standards for these kinds of buildings that articulate what it is we're looking for. To Darren's point, he's asking, what are we looking for? <clears throat> I don't know. We're throwing out things, but they don't have really a set of design standards that they say, okay, you know, Parks Department starts us well, off. They or, have, and they're just not very good. Yeah, or, or, or <laughs> I mean, <laughs> or, you know, public, you know, and they say, well, let's just build what, what we have everywhere else. That's not good enough because you'll never get it changed. You'll keep building these buildings. They're going to last 30 years or 40 years, and you're going to build the same building. And so maybe it's shame on us that we don't have the design standards that Dave is talking about for these kinds of buildings and incorporating some of the things, uh, like you said, that we want in Imagine Oshkosh that we start to do that. So I'm saying this particular building may be a little bit premature. We can go back and we don't have to develop all the design standards before we build this building, but we can make maybe some changes in terms of what Ed was talking about in materials and things of that nature to make this a little bit different, you know, type of thing, maybe a different, you know, color roof. You know, I, I don't know. You use a green roof. You use maybe the same kind of brick that you have on the city build, uh, the, the the city garage, because then it kind of ties all these structures together to saying this is a city structure, because it is similar in terms of, uh, you know, you'll see that oh, that's a city garage. Oh, we go over here. Oh, that's a, another, you know, you know, type of a building that that is recognizable. Okay. So, I, th I don't know that we can beat this up any more than we already have. Do we have, is anybody prepared to make any kind of motion? Yeah. David. Um, I moved to late over six, uh, three meetings. And that, that part of the discussion in two meetings is what this facility is going to look like and that we can vote on it in, for a recommendation in three meetings. Does it need that many? I mean, if we workshopped it next meeting? Uh, oh, we, we, we could potentially bring you back. Kind of next meeting. Let's workshop it next we, meeting. Well, or we could potentially I mean, bring you back. We could make some changes to it and for that we've heard today and bring it back to the next meeting. Um, Go ahead, David. You don't have to approve. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, the um, Steve. Steve's got. Uh, yeah. One thing to keep in mind is the the renderings are. Blah. They're not very well and colorful. I don't know how many of you have been out to actually see. We've seen the, it. The, the other structures. Okay, about. that's good. Um, just want to make sure that that was there. And then to the timing of six weeks, um, that would probably mean that we cannot get the siphon corrected in 2008 and 2017. Then that will push out timelines of this completion too long to start the next project to correct the siphon. Um, to, how many meetings could it? What What's the time frame that they have? Uh, to, to potentially make adjustments, propose some changes that will still meet your time frame? It's going to depend on the extent. If it's going to mean we have to throw it out and rebid it, um, we'll need to know very soon. If it's, um, as Ed suggested, some change in materials and a couple extra dormers, it's, um, you know, those aren't major structural issues. We can probably work with the contractor that was current low bid to work through those processes, but we'll certainly want to do that prior to awarding the bid so that we don't um, find out that it's going to be a very substantial change order into a contract. And, and let me ask this uh, from a staff perspective, if we could accomplish some of this in the next, by November 7th, 7th I think is our next meeting, uh, that we could get some of these things incorporated, we could potentially bring it back uh, by the no November 7th meeting, that would bring it up to the, if you like it, uh, it, would, it would bring it to the council meeting. Would that still keep a time frame? The next call, so November seventh. We, we would probably lose a two week period at that, which we could probably work with in the construction yeah. timeline. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. It, rather than lay over three weeks, weeks, three weeks, if we could, if we yeah. could bring it back to the November, in one meeting, November seventh meeting, so. to try and accomplish the things that that the plan commission has laid out, all has kind of his marching orders, and we can talk about it. Uh, at least we'll try and. We'll continue to try and keep the schedule. Okay, can I make uh, yeah. one other um, request? And that is to have the Parks Department here, uh, or the sure. representative of the Parks Board. They need to be able to see what. And, and, and I'm, I'm really disturbed uh, why they didn't hear our message. <clears throat> and why, and I would have DPW, if they were designing these, why they didn't hear this. I mean, we're, we're talking about tone deaf here. Um, and if it's, if it's really necessary that we have to 
to give greater direction of the design of public buildings, then, then that will, you know, maybe is an action item for this group. Uh, but you know, I didn't think that that was that that was necessary because it was the boat works. I think it is. Yeah, okay. And right. So I make a motion uh, that we lay it over for two weeks and that we have uh, uh, proposed des uh, design changes. Second. Uh, and moved and seconded the latest over one meeting. Sure. This will be a long meeting, but I'm just All right, telling you. Right. <laughs> Any other discussion on that motion? All right, seeing none, call the roll, please. Lay over. Holmes. Aye. Ince. Aye. Prop. Aye. Eber. Aye. Iger. Aye. Ford. Aye. Borsak. Aye. Owen. Aye. Koytek. Aye. <coughs> Carried 9-0. Oh, moving, moving on to item number three, conditional use permit request to establish an outdoor storage use at 1850 West Furno Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to establish an outdoor storage use on a previously developed lot. Uh, the property is zoned HI Heavy Industrial District, and outdoor storage is a conditional use in that district. Um, the site is located in the Northwest Industrial Park, and it was previously used for industrial and light manufacturing purposes. Uh, the property owner recently received a conditional land use variance from GoADC uh, for an auto repair and towing operation at the site. Uh, the site has one structure with a uh, square footage of 10,200 uh, square feet and roughly 28,000 square feet of paved parking area and a 20,000 square foot graveled area to the rear of the building. The petitioner would like to use the existing graveled area to the north of the building um, for outdoor storage of customer vehicles. Uh, as the area is greater than 500 square feet, um, it makes it a principal land use which requires a conditional use permit. Uh, the outdoor storage area will be approximately 50 stalls and will contain abandoned or wrecked vehicles that would be towed to the property and stored until all legal obligations are met. Uh, all service work would be performed uh, all service work that's performed on site will be performed indoors. Um, here's the site plan. Um, the orange lines are the existing fencing, which are seven foot tall, 10% uh, opaque um, slatted fencing. And then the blue line on the east and north, uh, along the east and north property lines, will be the new fencing that is to be installed to completely enclose the area. Um, the zoning ordinance requires um, storage land uses to be enclosed by eight foot tall uh, solid <coughs> fencing. Um, so the existing fencing would need to be modified to meet that requirement and the new fencing would need to be eight feet tall and solid. Uh, staff is in support of the proposed outdoor storage land use as the uh, use should not be detrimental to the uh, surrounding area, provided that the required screening is, inst is installed around the storage area. Uh, staff is recommending conditions that the outdoor storage area be screened in accordance with the outdoor storage land use requirements in the zoning ordinance, uh, that all vehicles and items be stored on the gra existing gravel area, and the gravel area may not be expanded. It's a real nice area. All right, thank you very much. Technical questions. Yeah. David. Um, as this was, so this is a little more than, than just adding a fence. It's adding outdoor storage for up to 50 spaces. Um, does this really, should this really go back before it comes to the uh, Plant Commission to uh, the GO EDC Industrial Parks uh, Committee because the use is different or the intensity is different than what was proposed uh, at that time? Uh, and then the second question is, uh, can you tell me, uh, do you know what the SIC code is uh, for this use? So the first part of it, I believe Go EDC was aware of the full scope of what was going on here when they made their decision and a representative from, from um, that organization is here that we have some specific questions we can try to answer. Uh, second question, no idea. When Dana gets back, we can touch that okay, with him as well. He should be back in a moment. Other technical questions? Okay, anyone here from the public to speak to this item today? You'd like to answer?
Kimberly Land, 1654 Gulf Bridge Drive in Nina. Um, I work for Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corporation and we granted the uh, land use variance for Felix Auto to be located in that building. So I can address any questions that you have as it relates to that variance. Questions for Kimberly? Go ahead, David. And I'll ask you the question because I, I don't recall that there was uh, up to storage up to 50, mo uh, 50 uh, inoperable automobiles. Uh, at that at this location I think when we approved the variance it was just for the auto repair center we don't really approve the land use that's behind the fence so the integrity of the operation is still the same it's just what's stored behind the fence that answers your question Darren might know further too other questions for Kimberly as long as she's here. Is, was, Okay. What? I have a question. Would you know, or, or is the owner here, just to know what the SIC code? And, and there, there's a method to that, to that that question. I don't know the SIC. And I don't know if Eric does. No. All right. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? All right. Back to the commission, David. Um, the, the SIC co code question was. Uh, and you know, sort of full disclosure, I, I, I was on the Go, Go EDC committee that reviewed this, and uh, I think that even though I'm you know un, uncomfortable the, the way this is coming back around, uh, that I have less of an issue if it's fully screened. Uh, but I think that there's the question I have regarding the SIC code is that depending on the SIC code, certain stormwater conditions are, are re, uh, required. And if this business is not uh, one of those covered uh, uh, enumerated uh, uses uh, in the Federal Register, that I would say is a term because of, of fluid management, hydraulic fluids, we're looking at wrecked cars. Uh, uh, what may or may not be unreasonable to say that all these wrecked cars have to be on a paved service, that at least that there is a stormwater pollution plan that is written uh, by uh, <coughs> an environmental consultant and presented to the um, to the um, Department of Public Works uh, so that it shows adequate control of, uh, of in particular oils and greases and what other uh, 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 items would be um, uh, germane to, to this type of operation it, it, it's you know, this is this is this is not just sort of a made-up deal. This is something that that will be cumulative and 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 something that, that that should be addressed not only for this property but also runoff or uh, and uh, it could negatively affect other properties. David, what's SIC code? What does that Stick mean? Stick code. It's a business uh, code. Standard industrial classification. Okay. We're going to see if we can grab Steve quick and get him back up here too. Maybe help answer. Okay. Yeah, he's not allowed to leave. Other thoughts or questions while we're waiting for Steve? Go ahead, Jeff. Um, I'm going to have to recuse myself on this because I know the petitioner. Um, I have been out to that property just a couple of days ago, <laughs> um, and he has confirmed to, to, to almost all of that you have here. I've seen it, but the other question that, that I have for David is: is that I don't. I know we've done other outdoor storage, you know, vehicles and stuff, and we have not required them to do that same th you know, thing that you're you're talking about. So I don't know if we could do that on this property. Although your point is well taken, <clears throat> that from this, you know, going forward, that we have something similar to this, because I don't disagree with what you're saying. Well, I, I think that what allows us is that because it's conditional use permit, um, and it is in a city industrial park. But we're uh, doing this after the fact. No. Yeah, it is. He's already got the building. He's already got an operating business there. We're doing this after the fact. After Go EDC is already. No, but, but, but Go EDC was not aware that there was going to be a storage of inoperable automobiles. That I can tell you, that it was just going to be a towing service and repair. It was not going to be uh, that, that... Well, then shame on Go EDC because his existing business that they made him move had that type of operation, which was right down the street on Fernal Avenue. But it, when, when you give us a, a scope of operation, that, that would be part of that. And I'm not, ar and again, I'm not arguing the fact that, that they're stored. 
I, it, but I think that the fact of dealing with with real, not imagined pollution and, and some simple best management practices and the way you're going to get those best management practices is through a stormwater pollution prevention plan. That's all. I'm just trying to to address a real but uh, and, and not minimal potential. What did I miss? <laughs> you can't go away. <laughs> what, 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 no, thank you. Steve, what, the question I have is because of the use, and, 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 and this, prop, this use may not be covered by an enumerated SIC code that they have to have a SWIP, is that uh, I would like to have ha a condition of uh, doing this in addition to the fencing is that they develop a, you know, that they have a, a, an environmental consultant develop a stormwater pollution prevent, prevention plan to, uh, in particular, to address runoff of oils and greases and other, uh, and if we're having wrecked automobiles, we know we're going to have leakage of oils and greases and, and fluids, other fluids. Yeah. A auto shop um, type thing or any of those are required by the DNR, I believe, to have certain permits and regulations in place for those type of features. So I don't believe there would necessarily be a requirement necessary from this committee um, beyond the fact that maybe if you wanted to reiterate the fact that they make sure they obtain all appropriate DNR permits for auto service, salvage, storage of those type of facilities. Okay. Because it may be I, I it may be well beyond a SWIP that's needed. That that's why I don't want to I don't want to restrict them to a, a SWIP if that's not what the DNR would would dictate as an appropriate measure for that. There may there may it may not be spill prevention that's needed plan. It may be some there may be have to be some actionable item taken as part of that development. Well, could, uh, the verbiage would be then in, in compliance with all. Uh, regulatory rules and regulations, but not limited to having a SWIP if they're not required to have a SWIP? I don't know that by code we can require a SWIP. Okay, and that, I'm not, I'm not, I'd have to really dig into that. that. It, yeah. But I think that it would be important if, if, if that. Was. Certainly, the, the concern is valid. I, and I, I believe the DNR has the same concern, and that's why. There are numerous permits that are supposed to be out there for any of the auto shop. Any um, auto shop is supposed to have a certain permit, um, any of those things, <clears throat> for those kind of considerations to try to mitigate those, those items. And I, I would assume that it's likely a SWIP of some sort. They may not call it by that same name for this, but something along those lines is necessary. All right, other technical questions? All right, seeing none, anyone here from the audience to speak to this item today? Okay, back to the commission. I'd like to make a motion to accept with the addition uh, and the recommendation of the conditions that they follow all DNR regulations. Second. Discussion on the motion? All right, call roll. Holmes. I abstain because of a conflict. Hence. Aye. Rob. Aye. Kiefer. Aye. Weiger. Aye. Ford. Aye. Borsak. Aye. Bowen. Aye. Boytek. Aye. <clears throat> Motion carried, 801. All right, item number four, conditional use permit request for a freight terminal development at 3, 3010 Bradley Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That. How did I miss the words? Yeah, Steve could go. Can I have any questions for Steve? You better that. stick around. I don't. Without no, back. I don't. Bradley Street? Uh, thing. Bradley Street? Yeah. I just want to, he's got other things to do. He's got to work on a, on a, on a thing that we just looked for. Oh, he's got to design a bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a lift station for him. All right. He's got to go pump a bathroom station. <laughs> okay, this is a this is a conditional use request for a freight terminal located at 3010 Bradley Street. Uh, the site is approximately 500 feet north of West Waukai Avenue. The site's just under eight acres in size, zoned heavy industrial. 
zoning and the 10 and 20 year comprehensive land use plan recommends industrial de development for this site. The proposed development is bounded by industrial uses to the uh, north and west, um, uh, cemetery to the south, and an active rail line to the east. Here we go, there it's just an aerial of a site. The site is vacant currently, um, with the exception of a rail spur that runs from the west and to the east towards <laughs> the southern portion of the property. Uh, the applicant's proposing to develop a freight terminal for semi tractors and trailers. The use is permitted via conditional use permit within the HI zone district and is compatible with existing uses in the area. The facility will out operate intermittently 24 hours a day, seven days a week with approximately 100 trips to and from the site per week. Uh, the applicant states that there's a possibility of a future expansion, including a terminal building and additional semi-truck and trailer parking areas. At that time, um, if he does move forward, he would, would need to come back before this board and come and counsel for an amendment to the conditional use permit. Uh, this is an overall site plan. The proposed development consists, consists of a 250 foot by 100 156 foot or 39,000 square foot asphalt paved area set back 50 feet from the uh, Bradley Street right away, 24 feet from the north lot line, and 78.6 feet um, from the south lot line. Uh, and the east edge is approximately 600 feet from the uh, railroad uh, right of way. Um, all minimum setbacks are, re are met for within the HI district. In addition to the paved surface or the asphalt surface, there is a, you look at that concrete dolly pad, that's a 10 foot wide strip that goes from east to west and that's for use of um, the semi, um, what you call it, the, the thing that the front uh, rests on, I can't find the word in here. Dolly pad. Dolly pad, thank you. Um, the plan also shows a proposed six foot tall chain link fence at the 50 foot setback line along Bradley Street and along the north lot line uh, from the east to the north. The south line is lined with a very dense mature cedar tree row running over 700 feet from uh, Bradley Street back towards the, the back of the property and serves as a very, um, very effective sound and visual, visual buffer from the cemetery <coughs> east to the south. Uh, access to the site consists of a class three entrance from Bradley Street just south of center of the site. Uh, the plan shows a 37 and a half foot opening at the property line and 60, uh, 68 foot curb opening at the road surface. Uh, the access control ordinance requires a 40 foot wide driveway at the property line and the 70 foot curb opening. So this, this issue will be discussed during site plan review. Uh, parking, um, parking requirements for this particular use is based on the maximum number of employees present, or present uh, at the maximum shift. Um, initially, there's no plans for employees to be on site, so technically there is no uh, parking requirements. Uh, however, there probably will be a need for uh, vehicles to park there, but there's plenty of paved surface av available if the need arises on a short-term or temporary basis. Uh, the applicant did submit a, uh, or did not submit a sign package. All sign signage will need to meet the requirements allowed in the heavy industrial district. The lighting plan was, was submitted. Light levels do meet code requirements. Uh, however, the dolly pad configuration differs from the, the base site plan, so we're recommending that the uh, the lighting plan be revised so it matches the overall site plan. Uh, the overall site plan also incorporates landscaping um, due to the low amount of developed uh, structures. Um, minimal, minimal landscaping is required. Um, so landscaping is shown as uh, five different trees and some shrubberies along the front property line and the setback area. Uh, staff will verify that it does meet minimum landscaping requirements uh, for the HI district. Uh, stormwater management plans have not been submitted at this time and plans will be required to be reviewed and approved by the Department of Public Works. So with that, um, staff is recommending approval of the conditional use permit for the freight terminal with two conditions, that the driveway entrance be uh, changed to a uh, code compliant class three 40, 
40 foot slash 70 foot opening and the photometric plan shall be revised to match the site site plan and landscape plan all right thank you technical questions jeffrey and then david why are we not requiring that that uh, chain link fence you know have some kind of screening or whatever uh, to, so that from bradley as you drive through is it because it's just a, because it's in an industrial park? it's it well the industrial use it's not technically storage storage per se it's a active transfer station for semis and but they have, they have semi stored there. No. Oh. We we debated on that. And, and potentially yeah. tractors mm -hmm. uh, stored there you, overnight. So I was just wondering why we didn't require that screening. And I guess this goes back to our we never have storm water ideas. Well, I, yeah, but in place not by the time we're we're voting for it, Frank. Or, well, this is what this is just. What's the action? It's a. It's not a the conditional use. No, it's a conditional use permit. Conditional use permit. It's not. We're yeah. not at the. That's a. So that would come under site review. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that coming back through here? No. Correct. It'll just. Yes, have, my point. It'll just have to meet our stand. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's, has it's to like, follow code anyways. You're not going to come in. We're not going to. We're not showing you the dimensions of the dolly pad, <coughs> and what the cross sections are of that for the construction. But is that is that all impervious today? No, no, it's, it's undeveloped. No, so it just has to meet whatever our stormwater requirements are. That's All right. So the fact that it's not impervious that they're going to create impervious mm -hmm. is going to require it because if it wasn't, if it's already impervious, then I'll do anything. Correct. Correct. Whatever our standards are from a stormwater perspective, they'll be required to meet it. You can't, you can't go over and above on every project and say we want you to put additional stormwater because it's something that you that you need to take. On if it was a planned development or something like that as part of a trade-off or a zone change or things like that But I mean you're using you're using the conditional use process to implement a, 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 An ordinance change that should be gone through and done as part of the municipal code You shouldn't use this process to do something like that David frankly, I mean uh, we yeah, should, you're right. Uh, I'm uh, a little unclear is the only portion of this property that's going to be used is what would be west of snow removal correct at this time okay um, and what is going to be used is all paved is that correct correct well currently it's unimproved but all the improvements they're proposing is just this little 39,000 square foot area right here which is over 20,000 square feet. So then you're bringing in, you know, you're bringing in our stormwater requirements. But, okay, where I'm following, what is our, by code or by, about paving uh, that surface in, in, in parking lots or what, however you want to characterize that. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that that whole area should be paved. It shouldn't be a graveled, or I'm suggesting, I'm questioning what. It is going to be asphalt. Okay, so it's all the only the only portion. There's this. Yeah, this entire thirty-nine thousand square feet will okay. be asphalt. Besides this strip, which will be concrete, with a okay, okay. semi dolly pads. Okay. Other technical questions, or go ahead, Jeff. But I guess to your point, Darren, is if they have to meet our stormwater mm -hmm. requirements, where is there going to be land for them to do that? Yeah, they're two thirds of the side. I mean, that, yeah. if, if you want, I mean, we can wait. Our engineer is here. He, he, we can okay. we can discuss that. Uh, with that him. That's, that's he's good. I think he's still. Yeah, there's Jeff. He's in the back. Yep. Other technical questions. Okay, seeing none. Anyone here from the audience to speak to this item today? Come on up, ma'am. <laughs> that's why I'm actually here today. <laughs> Lucinda Porter, 80 Myrn Myrna Jane Drive. I only live a few blocks from there, and I'm on the. Peace Cemetery Lutheran Board <clears throat> and the board I know we're concerned Bradley's not a very well maintained road I mean there's not much to it there's going to be a hundred trucks a week from what I heard and that's going to really rip up the road and I'm concerned about the road also in front of the cemetery the Wacaw Road um, is the city going to be able to afford to maintain that um, it's not that wide now so if you're going to have that many trucks it's gonna, that road's gonna take a beating, and 
Um, obviously, it's going to increase the traffic, and we might need a wider road on Waukaw, in fact, because we already got the hydrite on the other side, and they have a lot of trucks that block Waukaw when they're trying to back in anyway. So I'm hoping the city's looking towards that and that cost of the upkeep of the roads there. Okay, thank you. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? Seeing none, back to the commission. Oh, 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 oh come on up. I'm As sorry. promised. Jeff Rustic, Schuler and Associates. Oh, okay. uh, stormwater. Yes, working through stormwater with uh, John Ferris from your engineering department. Um, his actual recommendation for the, the method is a, a pervious pavement design. So that's what we will be bringing forward when we bring the, the formal site plan uh, forward to the city. Do we have any other questions for the petitioner, David? Yeah. Would the owner have any problem as a condition that, that the operation of, of trucks can only be on the paved surface? There is only paved surface. Yeah, you own how much property do you? Oh, to the back. Yeah. yeah. Sure. That. Yeah. The, the, no it's trailers. only going to be on huh? the. the no trailer, no nothing. Yeah, that's right. correct. Anything else for the engineer? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? All right, back to the commission. Go ahead, David. Um, I don't have a real problem. I think this, this is you know one of the areas that's obviously permitted within our industrial parks, even though this, whether this is a, it's really our first industrial park, um, <coughs> that I would, I would suggest that we just have one, one limiting factor or one condition or a, a third additional uh, condition and that is that the operation of, of, of vehicles can only be on the paved surface so that we don't encroach on any unpaved surfaces. Other comments, thoughts? Is that a motion? I would like to make a, a motion right. to amend or that maybe can roll this up to add condition yep. three. Okay. Um, that, right. that operation can only be on paved surfaces. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion itself? Go ahead, John. So when do we or get, be concerned with uh, the, the concerns that the, this lady brought forward with the roads? Um, we just okay the development and not worry about that? I mean, when does that become an issue that we, or someone takes up? <clears throat> that's an issue that's taken up generally by public works through the CIP process. So as part of the pays or part of their evaluation of uh, when a road gets redone, uh, any other road that's in the city, it's same, the same, kind of the same concept. Who takes care of it and how they take care of every road? The adjacent property owners are always going to pay for a portion of it. The city pays for the middle. So I don't know where, where Bradley is in, in, on the pacer, you know, rating when, it, when, it's, when it's supposed to be reconstructed. I mean, we can make a note and check, but you know, it's, it's going it, to follow whatever program that we have for any other road in the community. Yeah. Um, Darren, do we not already have an ordinance about um, operate or utilizing non-paved surfaces and storage of vehicle or equipment on non-paved? Um, yeah, you can't just store on gr you can't just store on ground. You're generally supposed to store on asphalt or gravel. Uh, I, I guess the reason I'm asking is are we being overly redundant with the doesn't hurt? I, I, I mean, it's, yeah, it's in not going to it, as a condition. Yeah, as a condition, <laughs> it's not going to hurt. Reinforces it. Any other discussions on the motion? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, call it open. Wait a minute, uh, Thomas. It's just on the motion. Is it, nobody moved to approve it. We just yeah. Moved, no, he moved to third. approve it. He moved, he to, moved approve. to approve it. His motion had the third condition, and Bob yep. seconded it. Okay. Rolled it all into one. Yeah, which is why I questioned the third condition. All right, <laughs> All right, call roll. Holmes. Hi. Hens. Aye. Rob. Aye. Buford. Aye. Weigert. Aye. Ford. Aye. Forsyth. Aye. Bowen. Aye. Boyd. Aye. Motion carried 9-0. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to something more fun. You want uh, yes, <laughs> item number seven, approval of River East Neighborhood Plan. All right, the next, uh, the next three items are all plans. Uh, these are more aspirational. We appreciate the patience of the people in the audience. We were, yes, we, we, do. Were, we were not anticipating the length of the meeting. Thank you, David. You'll never make and that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make it. Next meeting. So, what's that? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
<laughs> so fun stuff now. Yep. Uh, staff requests approval of the River East neighborhood plan. Um, this thing. What's the matter? Gave the reading. You read it. It's awesome. For, it. I don't know. I did all week. Oh, it's like. No, it's. Well, just you, you okay. just start talking. Oh. So, <laughs> so there will be a map on the screen. The boundaries are Washington Avenue to the north, Bowen Street to the east, the Fox River to the south, and Main Street to the west. This will be, or hopefully, will be the fourth neighborhood plan. Uh, recent efforts by residents and partner organizations have centered on enhancing existing assets to provide stability and ensure the River East neighborhood continues to be one of choice in Oshkosh. The purpose of this review is for the Plan Commission to make a determination that the proposed goals and objective, objectives within the plan are consistent with the comprehensive plan, official maps, or other planning objectives of the city. This plan is prepared for the River East Neighborhood Association to support their efforts in addressing neighborhood challenges and promoting reinvestment. Created during a year-long resident-led process, the plan be, may be used by the River East Neighborhood Association, the City of Oshkosh, and partner organizations to ensure neighborhood improvements and activities are implemented to meet the needs of the residents. The plan serves the following purposes. To educate participating organizations on the vision of the future, promote collaboration to achieve mutual goals, create pride of place within the community, initiate change by addressing specific issues and opportunities, and strengthen the city by improving the quality of life within neighborhoods. The plan includes a neighborhood history and a snapshot of current conditions. The plan then outlines four priority areas, which include image, market, physical conditions, and neighborhood management. Each section then provides goals, objectives, and specific action items. Staff recommends approval of this plan. Uh, they've reviewed all the elements and they have found that identified goals and objectives are not in conflict with the comprehensive plan. All right, any technical questions? Not that we would have any for something like this. Okay, anyone in the public uh, out there who's been waiting forever here to speak to this item today? Tell us something positive, ma'am. Kathy Webb, 543 Otter Avenue, and I am very excited about our neighborhood plan. I'm excited about our neighborhood. We've got, this plan hasn't even been approved yet, and there's things already happening over in River East. It is just wonderful uh, with everything going on in Washington and our new streets going on these last few years. And um, I've lived in my house 37 years on Otter, and the revitalization that's going on, the young families moving in our neighborhood, the kids running around, it is just exciting and wonderful. So I ask you all to read this over and approve it. We will be back next week, sitting over on this side, to um, talk to the city council. But do um, you have any questions? Uh, just an observation, I went through this pretty thoroughly. Uh, I happen to be on the board of the GoH&I, and uh, I, I think this is extremely well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, we thank had you a for your efforts on Yes, we on had a, one, a lot of wonderful neighbors and community members and Alexa and Stephen that, and uh, Elizabeth, who is no longer here, but everybody has really um, helped support us and teach us, and um, I'm learning all the time. So thank you very much. Anybody else here speak to them today? Go ahead, John. Oh. Uh, she, has, has, she, has, she has a question for you. Oh, oh no, just, oh. just wanted to commend the use. This is my old stopping ground where I grew up. And, oh. Um, very impressive document, and thank you for all your good work on this. Yes, thank you. All right. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? Seeing none, back to the commission. Motion to approve. Second. 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 I got it. Oh, okay. Was that like a roll call vote? All right, call a roll. <laughs> Tomes. Aye. Hints. Aye. Drop. Aye. Efer? Aye. Weiger? Aye. Ford? Aye. Forsyth? Aye. Boytag? Oh, I'll abstain on this one. Motion carried 701. Item number eight approval of neighborhood streetscape vision plan. Staff requests approval of the neighborhood streetscape vision plan, which focuses on the Miller's Bay neighborhood. 
So the boundaries are Murdoch Avenue to the north, Hazel Street on the west, George Washington Triangle to the south, and Lake Winnebago to the east. The neighborhood has begun to look towards implementing goals of the neighborhood plan, which was adopted by Common Council in 2015. Recent, recent efforts have centered on enhancing existing assets by providing stability. The purpose of this review was for the Plan Commission to make a determination that the proposed recommendations are consistent with the planning objectives for the city. The goal was to develop a conceptual streetscape design plan for the Millers Bay neighborhood with recommendations that address crosswalk improvements, wayfinding and identity signage, multimodal transportation improvements, above ground utilities, traffic calming features, streetscape amenities, landscaping, safe routes to school improvements, and inconsistent street lighting. This plan is prepared for the Millers Bay Neighborhood Association to support their efforts in addressing neighborhood challenge, challenges and promoting reinvestment. The plan first explains goals and objectives followed by a snapshot of current conditions. The plan then outlines five priority areas. And you can see on the screen, they're highlighted in red. And the first area is Murdoch and Hazel, <coughs> Emmeline Cook and Hazel, George Washington Triangle, Nevada and Menominee Drive, and Cliff View and White Swan. Approval of this plan does not indicate that all recommendations of the plan can or will be implemented immediately. Implementation will depend on funding resources and approval of each individual project as well as additional stakeholder input. Private property recommendations are intended to provide ideas for the neighborhood or individuals to implement independently from the city. Staff has reviewed all plan elements and recommends approval, finding that the identified goals and objectives are not in conflict with the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Any technical questions? Seeing not anyone here from the public to speak to this item today. Fine up, sir. Hi, Jim Michelson, 1515 North Point Street. Uh, I've lived in the Millers Bay neighborhood for 37 years. Um, I attended two public meetings on the streetscapes plan. Uh, I, the, street, the streetscapes committee did a very good job working on the plan, and they really care about our neighborhood, and I want to really state that. Uh, the first meeting I attended was in July, and it was to see what the plan was all about. You know, I, I really didn't know what was going on with it, so I went to the meeting in July to find out what was going on. Uh, one part of the draft showed at least uh, six inter intersection improvements with traffic calming bump out intersections. Most were on the perimeter of the neighborhood and gateways to our neighborhood. Uh, at the meeting, uh, or looking closer at the plan, it looked like the traffic calming areas were very narrow. And they seemed very narrow and they would possibly intimidate um, or endanger a bicyclist when they came through such a narrow area. At the meeting, I asked if they would look at the width and do the math and figure out what the minimum width should be. And they were very receptive to that. Um, going over, in my opinion, uh, of how you look at the width of when you when you take a road and you start to narrow it down to to make pedestrian crossings uh, there's a number of things you have to look at but one thing that some people forget especially in other states you see a lot of these grandiose plans um, when, when you do planning such as this one of the first things when it has to do with bicycles go is goes back to the state statutes and the Wisconsin state statute 346.075 which is under the chapter 346 rules of the road. And I'm just gonna state uh, the short little paragraph. Uh, 346.075 is overtaking and passing bicycles, electric uh, uh, system mobility devices and motor buses. Number one, the operator of a motor vehicle overtaking a bicycle or elect electric personal assistive mobility device proceeding in the same direction so shall exercise due care, leaving a safe, safe distance but in no case less than three feet clearance when passing the bicycle or electrical personal device. And it goes on a few, a few another sentence. And this is important. So when I, like I had asked the committee and the, and the consultant to do the math, um, that's, what I, that's what I meant. 
And I'll, I'll give you my math from you know my interpretation, and you you can take it however you want. It kind of goes back to some of the standards, very close to what some of the, the standards are in you know with this kind of thing. Um, but if you look at a bike going down a road, okay, so a bike here. Let's say here's the cur here's the curb on the right side. Um, people aren't perfect. You need a couple feet. Let's be realistic. Nobody can sit there and ride on the curb, so you need probably two feet. Then you have a bicycle, and there may be two feet. So you got two feet, two feet. Now you have state law that says a car can't be within three feet of you. So there's three more feet. And then just add on whatever you want, whatever the, the traffic lane is, let's say nine feet, you're at 16 feet to the middle. So that would mean that you know, you're at 32 feet if you're looking at the total, let's say if you're doing a bump out, you know, or any kind of street or a bump out, you, it would be logical to make 32 feet to make it safe for everybody and not intimidating for bicycles. And they can be very intimidating, some of these, some of these bump outs. Um, at the next meeting, uh, the September meeting, the plan showed five intersection improvements that showed traffic calming uh, bump outs in the plan widened to 32 feet. I must commend the committee and, and, the, and the consultants for changing the plan, taking the input, and, and, and considering this. Um, it's refreshing to see a plan that respects the, both, the rights of both the pedestrians, which bump outs are trying to do, and also bicyclists. In the, in the past few years, we've had a few streets in our city with bump outs that I don't feel address the need of bicycles. They are too narrow, and they, they cause what I was talking about, th those issues. Hopefully the approach followed in this plan will be used in future street bump out designs uh, throughout the city. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? I'm Ruth McGinley from Miller's Bay Neighborhood. I am the president of the association and also a member of the leadership team for the streetscape plan. And also Wayne Miller and Polly Kimball are with us and they were on the leadership team also. Um, when we started talking about a streetscape, a lot of people asked, what is a streetscape? And the best definition I found for that is a street that is safe, sustainable, and beautiful. And we feel like this plan that SCH created for us uh, meets all of that criteria and more. Um, if you've had a chance to look at it, you'll see that it really is pretty fabulous. And um, we thank the city for funding uh, that project. Um, this plan um, meets the goals and objectives of our neighborhood plan, of the strategic plan for the city, which mentions um, strengthening neighborhoods and improving infrastructure. It meets some of the comprehensive plan objectives for utilities and transportation and other things we've talked about. It um, meets the Go H and I and city's objectives for neighborhoods, which are to enhance the image, market, and physical conditions of the neighborhood. And lastly, it embraces the healthy neighborhood philosophy, which encourages high standards. So um, we ask that on behalf of the Millers Bay neighborhood that you support this plan and we thank you again for funding it, the city, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about that. Okay, so do we have any questions for Ruth? Go ahead, Kat. I just wanna say thank you very much, you and the other people here for working so hard on this plan. And thank for you. listening to Jim Michelson's concerns. I think those are valid. Sure. Any other thoughts for Ruth? Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? All right, seeing none, back to the commission. Motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Let's call the roll. Tomes? Aye. Pence? Aye. Rob? Aye. Paper? Aye. Tiger? Aye. Ford? Abstain. Forsyth? Aye. Foytek? Aye. I'm on the board. <laughs> Motion carried 701. All right, we're at item number nine, and it's nowhere near midnight. Approval of the Imagine Oshkosh plan and master plan for our center city, central city investment strategy. All right, we're here. Uh, John from John House Hill from yeah, House Hill Levine is here to do a presentation. As you know, we, we undertook it, we started this process uh, almost two years ago. Uh, we, got a little bit, we got a little bit sidetracked. 
the, the Imagine Oshkosh plan was kind of an offshoot of the Downtown Action Plan that we did in 2000. Uh, we came up with uh, the, the Downtown Action Plan was uh, focused generally in the bid area, kind of downtown. This plan for the Imagine Oshkosh is a broader area, as you're going to see, as you've seen with the plan itself. Um, it's uh, it's taken out. We've we had a stakeholder group. We've had uh, lots of public uh, input. We had a, we had a project website devoted to this. So John's going to give a brief pr presentation, uh, open up for questions, and then we're hoping to get this uh, approved so we can move it on uh, to the uh, council, uh, hopefully next month, and then for we'll adopt it at some point for under by reference under the uh, with the comprehensive plan. Uh, this, you know how to use that one, Matt. Yeah. So, with further ado, I'll turn it over to John Housefield to talk a little bit about the Imagine Oshkosh project. All right, uh, thanks everybody. I know it's uh, running late, so this will be real quick. Also, you know, I can go on and on, but I won't. No, um, you can go on and on. We got till midnight. Uh, you heard it. You heard it. We got till midnight. You may have to. Um, See you so later. I'm just going to go through this real quickly uh, again over the course of the last uh, 18 months or so. And so we're a little bit behind where we wanted to be in terms of schedule. Uh, we've had one on one interviews, we've had focus group discussions. Be here because and I'll stand over here by the podium, that's fine. Uh, we've had focus group discussions, business workshops, resident workshops, uh, workshops with the uh, plan commission, and uh, that's okay, I can stand here, that's all right. Uh, uh, workshops with the elected officials. Uh, we had a visioning workshop halfway through the process, then last month we had an open house uh, presentation where I think we had about 80 plus people attend, so it was really well attended, and feedback from that was pretty good. So imagine Oshkosh uh, is the master plan for the uh, uh, center city area uh, the outreach that we conducted over all those workshops i talked about really sort of focused and prioritized uh, uh, seven different themes the issue of housing economic development uh, uh, cohesion between uh, several different uh, sections of the downtown catalytic redevelopment opportunities uh, mobility and access uh, appearance character and identity uh, one of the things we did besides taking an extensive inventory of the entire downtown area when i say downtown I'm talking about a really, really, really large area. This runs approximately two miles from the northern tip to the southern tip. So it's considerably larger than a typical downtown plan would be. Typical downtown plan would just focus on sort of that traditional inline storefront area in the north part of the, the town. Uh, we broke the city down into uh, uh, several different functional areas. Downtown core, the outer core, uh, the downtown main core, uh, North Commercial Corridor, uh, and you can see all the different ones up here on the screen. And my PDF is not showing up. There it is. It's just oh. taking a while to load. So we may be here till midnight. <laughs> yeah. There's a real nice graphic on the opposite page here that's somehow not loading. It's like page 19 of your um, Yeah, right. Book. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why it's not loading. It was earlier. We could load up the low quality version, maybe it'll. Yeah, no, maybe I can do that. But well, we have something in front of us. So. Yeah, that's true. Try that. Those of us who brought our books. Hey. Oh, geez, not in the center. Uh, we broke it. My eyes. You still have your flash drive, and maybe just open it from there. Versions of this, right? Downstairs. Technical difficulties, sorry. That's all right. Did he go over this area once before? Can you see him? Yeah, yeah. I will try it this way and see if it loads up a little bit better on my flash side. Uh, so again, real quickly, after inventorying everything, we broke it down into these 
uh, nine different functional areas. So the downtown core, the outer core, the commercial corridor area on the north, the northwest transition area, the Marion Road waterfront area, South Shore West, South Shore Central, South Shore East, Oregon Street, and then the surrounding supporting neighborhoods. The reason we did this is this is such a large area that sort of a unified approach to all areas simply would not work. Uh, and so much of this area that was considered to be uh, the center city was really not downtown at all in terms of its built form and its character. You had large warehouse areas, you had single family residential areas, you had institutional areas by the campus, uh, and then you had sort of your traditional downtown areas, and you had waterfront areas which were altogether different. So the only way to provide recommendations of any kind of specificity was to break it down the map into these distinct 10 different areas, then have detailed recommendations for each one of these. For each one of these areas, in addition to uh, uh, an overall character assessment, we identified the land use that was desirable, the built form that was desirable, its relationship to surrounding areas and how that would function, uh, the overall character and functionality of these areas, uh, and then the design guidelines for what development in these areas should be like, because it was different from each single one. Uh, we then identified uh, several different uh, development opportunity sites. In theory, every site in a downtown is available for development if someone wants to buy it and tear it down. But given realistic market value and realistic uh, development potential, we identified the sites we thought would most likely be candidates for redevelopment in the next five to 10 years. We identified all these in the plan for each one of these. We have a narrative as to what the programming should be for each one of these sites over time. But then we identified four key sites working with the advisory committee uh, and identified what development could look like in terms of scale, bulk, built form, parking, and common open space. So for each one of these four key sites in the document, we identified what development should be like and what development programming would be like for each one of these sites. These aren't hard and fast recommendations. They're exploratory to visualize what could go given market conditions and zoning. So we did this for four different distinct sites. The other thing we did is we identified some of the larger development opportunity sites. And this is an example of the, the sawdust district uh, that you've uh, seen before. Uh, this poster exists uh, elsewhere here in the city hall and was used uh, in part to help lure the arena that we now have here. Uh, taking on board sort of a similar approach to see what we can't do with uh, Oshkosh Corporation uh, to the north. The other thing we did is we identified as a priority the critical mass and key areas. Not every area of the downtown is going to see super intense development over time, but certain areas that's exactly what we want. So we prioritize the key areas of the downtown to identify what types of critical mass of redevelopment should be taking place in these five key areas. And we also did a detailed market analysis. You'll see this and I won't go into it right now. But in the report, we did detailed market analysis to take a look at office, retail, restaurant, residential, to find out what your absorption capacity was for these different uses over time. So any recommendations we made here for development and or use was backed by market analysis. It wasn't just pie in the sky theory. We looked at your other regional uh, competition market for condominiums, for townhomes, for office space for employment in the downtown to see what you would have to do to position yourself against your regional competition. Uh, and all those market analyses are in this plan. We identified the uh, likely areas in each one of the quadrants for different types of residential growth uh, in terms of townhouses, apartments, condominiums, market rate, and maybe senior. And identified in each one of the areas of downtown where the different types of residential development should go. Increasing residential density and increasing the range of housing product was one of the key recommendations of the plan. This section really begins to drill down into that. We also did a detailed uh, analysis of your downtown parking, primarily picking up on the parking study that I think Walker did a few years ago. Uh, we looked at pedestrian mobility and prioritized the connect connectivity you have to have in all the different areas of downtown. While each of the 10 areas is very distinct, they have to function as one. So pedestrian mobility was a key consideration, as was transit. Compared to most downtowns, I gotta tell you, look at the map on the screen, you guys uh, have great transit. Uh, a lot of downtowns simply do not. Uh, we also looked at balancing the university's presence. We call this town and gown. Uh, there's a lot of good things about having a university near your downtown. There's a lot of challenges that come with this. We begin to try to address both of those in the plan. Uh, we identified as a strong component uh, sort of activating arts and culture in the center city, uh, establishing an arts uh, and cultural coalition, attracting new nooses which focus uh, and foster local culture, promoting public art, uh, sort of picking up on Oshkosh's unique features, supporting a lot of graduate initiatives, and then bolstering year-round events to pick up on the ones you already do so extremely well. 
We identified different sorts of public art and engagement techniques you could do in your downtown, picking out uh, some of the best examples from across the country, and we put those in here. Uh, we tried to identify to ensure investment and development is compatible and attractive. We actually developed, in addition to those 10 areas up front and design guidelines for each of those, we then developed another section on the design guidelines that addressed architectural style, building height, bulk, and proportion, building placement and orientation, parking areas and how to landscape those and locate those, building materials, doors and entrances, windows, roof lines and parapets, awnings and canopies, building signage, building lighting, and uh, rear yards and rear facades. Now for each one of these categories, I'm just gonna show you a few. We did a photo collage showing what those should be like, as well as providing detailed recommendations that can help you evaluate rec uh, buildings that come forward to see if they are or are not meeting the design intent of the downtown, depending on where the proposal was. So here's an example of the page for building materials. Here's the one for how parking lot areas should be designed. And here's the one talking about building lighting and rear facades. Now to go along with the building, the pictures as examples, the text below provides detailed recommendations on design. Uh, we also talked about establishing a sense of pedestrian scale and sense of place by making sure the street wall was complete throughout. This is a to give you a sense of scale. Uh, this image right here, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. right below where my dot is, you can't do dots on screens. Right below here is Imagine Oshkosh. The one over here to the right is Chicago's uh, Magnificent Mile. And those are to scale. So you can see that Chicago's Magnificent Mile, which is right below here, you know everything that's in that, and how dense and how big and whatever it is. That's only half of the length of the area you have as your center city. Uh, so it's a very, very, to give you a sense of scale, it's a very, very huge area uh, as part of this study. Um, we also talked about prioritizing streetscape, and we developed three different or four different hierarchies of streetscape uh, improvement in terms of design integrity and detail. And then we identified for each one of the streets in the downtown area, which streetscape application should be applied to what segment of roadway within your center city. So you know exactly the level of detail and the cross section and how it should be applied to exactly that color coded system in your downtown. So over time, as you begin to investigate streetscape opportunities and CIP expenditures, you can take a template of design and know exactly what should be applied in your downtown. And these are some best practices and innovations for pedestrian enhancement we put in here as well. Several examples, both in terms of text and visual acuity to show you how these things should be implemented in downtown. And the last section is implementation. This contains a few different sections, incentives and tools, how to fund programs, who to partner with and what their role is, and then implementation action matrix. What came out of the steering committee uh, that we had last month, and that several members of this group are on that advisory committee as well, uh, was the identification of what we would call the top five uh, as sort of a, as a starting point. So the top five here, I'm just going to walk up here and read them to you. It's to activate the upper floors of a long time or the existing buildings you have right now. You've got an amazing building stock, but a lot of the upper floors are vacant or not being utilized at all. Your codes are a bit antiquated to begin to activate that space as residential or other types of space. we got to fix that. That's one. Uh, action item number P to attract uh, new businesses and uh, employees to move into the center city. I use this example. For every 200 employees you can get working in the downtown, even in an office setting, you increase your local spending by about $1.8 million a year in that downtown. For every 200 employees you can get to work in the downtown. That's huge numbers. People focus on residences, you gotta focus on employment as well. Encourage new residential development consistent with the plan, one of the top recommendations. Apply the design and development guidelines to all new development going forward. We gotta use this to evaluate going forward. Uh, and to really begin to activate and improve the waterfront as a unique amenity because other downtowns in the region don't have the waterfront you guys have. So while there are more than 140 specific recommendations contained in these tables, what you need to do, who you need to do it with, what the priorities and how much it costs, those five are the five that I think are the most important to begin to activate your efforts. But there are more than 140 listed in the table at the end of the document. That is the entire mansion Oshkosh plan in five minutes. <laughs> That's my overview. Um, there's a lot in there. We could talk about a lot of money. If you were at the open house last uh, month, you got to hear me talk for an hour and a half. So. Go ahead, David. Well attended, by the way. It was, yeah, it was 40 to 50 people. I was really pleased uh, by the turnout at that. Go ahead, David. Um, I was at the open house, 
and your and I appreciated your presentation. You said something that resonated with me, uh, both specifically and general, and that was when you were talking about the decision tree that grocery stores make. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you know that if you would just briefly say that uh, go over that, it may help understand what the decision tree that different types of commercial industrial uh, facilities go through to when when, when they look at uh, siting a particular uh, facility. Yeah, I'll give a couple of examples. There's two things I think that get what you're talking about. One I was referring to when most people talk about grocery stores, uh, they talk about it generally speaking. But when you talk about now back where you know down where I'm from, Jewel is like a real common one. So I don't know what's sort of a common seventy-five thousand square foot big grocery store up here. What's the brand? Festival. Festival. Okay, so festival. So when a grocery store like Festival looks at locating, their biggest determinant on where they're going to go is what? Anyone want to guess? It's rooftops, number of homes. You know, every ten thousand you know new people, another grocery store. It's pretty formulatic. They know uh, Whole Foods. You want to guess what their number one location criteria is? Disposable income, all right? Wealth, the, the amount of money they have. That's Whole Foods' biggest location criteria. Everybody loves Trader Joe's. They're phenomenal. Anyone want to know what Trader Joe's number one location criteria is? Education level of the population they're serving. So there's an example of a grocery store and three different versions all have different sizes, all have different formats, and all have a different top key location criteria. They factor in lots of different things. Uh, and the other thing to mention uh, is that the number one trend right now in economic development isn't financing. Uh, it's not putting together the best package in terms of numbers. It's sense of place. Uh, who wants to work in a place uh, if it's a place you don't want to spend time in? Uh, you know, we work all over the country, and the number one thing is you know, we don't want to be out in the middle of nowhere. We want to have a place where people, uh, our employees uh, can go to a brew pub after work or ride their bike to work or, or get a nice bite to eat or walk around at lunchtime in a nice environment, have some shopping. They want to go in communities and locations that are fantastic. It's the biggest enticement to getting employees and employers in a location. Um, so uh, developers are all looking for different criteria. Uh, and... Uh, major employers want to locate uh, where they want to live and where their employees are going to work based on a sense of place and the quality of life. It's not just the numbers working. Numbers could work in two different places. They're going to go to the place that's the better place to be, the cooler place to be, the one that has the amenities I want for me and my employees. <laughs> so that sense of place is crucial in the downtown to get people to want to move here to live and to move here to work. So, Thank you. Other thoughts or questions? Thank you. You've taken planning to a whole new level here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's that's really, well really nice to hear. I like and that. And I actually, I like the fact. I mean, the down. We've talked at all the various meetings right. about how the size of this. Right. It 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 makes sense here. Right. You're looking at these things because they they're so closely connected, even if it's geographically large. It's exactly right. Yeah. And the key to do it is it has to function as one downtown because it's a downtown we experience. And we had a lot of debate up front as to what that shape would be and like one person would say oh it's way too big a woman at the open house came to me and she said i can't thank you enough for including the area up to the north because i live up there no one ever looks at that so uh but they had to have unique approaches to make it work but it's all got to work as one so it's this might not be the right approach for any place else but it had to be this for oshkosh so it's exactly why we did it yeah um where does the uh, access portion of it come to access to the central city so quarters, quarters, they'll be coming next month. Right. That, that's a separate uh, yeah. next month. Yeah. Separate. And I know that you talked about quarters even leading up to this. I'm sitting over there with jotting down notes from your previous discussion about the frontage on Oshkosh Avenue and some other issues. Um, corridors are crucial. They are they're not in your downtown, but it is the front door and the approach to your downtown. And uh, they're completely different animals. They're hard to sort of plan around. Uh, but we've already looked at a couple. But this right away, there's probably five the city should be looking at over time. So we've begun to look at a couple of them. We'll probably be bringing November 21st. Corridor plan forward. Right now, like, that meeting's kinda, light, so we're going to go yeah. right there. Right. That kind of complements this plan. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. There's yeah. Just a, a corridor analysis done as well. Corridors, we were just talking not including Oshkosh Ave. Correct. The ones that we've looked at already are 9th and South Park. Okay. Were the first two that we were sort of charged with taking a look at. Yep, we'll, we'll bring them in. We're just, we knew this, this agenda. Yeah. So it was a, a, a really a fun project. I mean, it literally was. I got to tell you, the participation, especially even from like the business community, 
uh, boy, they really care. They're really activated, and they showed up to everything we asked them to show up to, both on the committee and in meetings. So uh, your local property owners and local business owners uh, in your center city are fantastic. Um, so you should be real happy with them. Yeah, and the one thing I would say that uh, you know, the project as we move forward with it, that this was a partnership between us and the chamber. And the right. Same thing with the downtown action plan. We got the same players back together to fund this particular project, and then uh, you know we had some. We created that steering committee. We had a lot of participation. There's a lot of good recommendations in here. It's a good plan. I hope you've had. I've read it over several times. I keep finding other stuff in there each time I read it over again. Right. Uh, a lot of good recommendations. We'll use the implementation section as we start budgeting and start working on our work program. Appreciate uh, the work that House of Levine has done. Now, do we need public comment on this one, or is it? We can hold it up for public comment. Anybody in public? Guys, have anything to add or say? Okay. All right, back to us. Motion to approve. Yes. Any discussion on the motion? Follow the roll, just so we can get this all official like. Holmes? Aye. Vince? Aye. Rob? Aye. Eford? Aye. Tiger? Aye. Ford? Aye. Borsak? Aye. And Fortin? Aye. Motion carried 8 0. We have a workshop. We have, first, we have to adjourn our meeting. Motion to adjourn. Adjourn. Second. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nobody? All right. Bob, we couldn't be.